Well, hello everyone. <laughs> this is probably not a voice you expected to hear, but it is here nonetheless. I, I'm inevitable, I suppose. Welcome to the CERT four hours of Cleveland. A bit of a truncated event for you. With me today is Ross McIntyre, and we will do our best to try and bring you all the action to the end. Had a bit of a bumpy start. Unfortunately, we missed the first few minutes of this race, but we're back. Um, yeah. GT3, GT4 action from Burke Lakefront Airport here in Cleveland, Ohio. Thanks for joining me, Ross. How are you doing today? Well, I'm pretty good. Thanks, Christian. Obviously, um, again, yeah, hello. You're probably not a voice you expect to hear either. This is my first event here at CERT, so uh, let's see how it runs. Um, yeah, pretty excited for this. I mean, there's uh, not many cars out on track. There's only about seven, which is uh, unfortunately a rather small number, but I'm sure it won't take away that much. There's still seven very highly competitive cars out there. And, uh, well, Cleveland is such a great track. You know, every corner is an overtaking zone. It's literally just an airport. It's so wide. You'll see in a minute on it as you uh, go through on the cameras. It is just, look how, it's just a runway. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So there is every overtaking opportunity in the world. And it's also not a particularly long track either. So you're going to be constantly dealing with traffic if you're in the GT3 cars. You know, the, your opponents are never going to be that far behind. Because it's not a tricky circuit to really master. So uh, hopefully the lap times will be very, very close. And uh, yeah, even though it's uh, even though it's only seven cars and the race has uh, been reduced to only four hours, it uh, should still be, well, it will be as exciting as we can make it, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll, be, it'll, it'll be still be good. I mean, Cleveland is a, uh, it is a very, very nice circuit in terms of a, a spectator standpoint. Lots of overtaking zones, you know, very quick lap, lots of uh, quick straights as well. So yeah, it should be good. And uh, obviously, now, now that we are up and running with the live stream after all the uh, pre-race shenanigans, uh, well, it just uh, that was the excitement, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just straight to the action. Um, yeah, very much a uh, classic sort of. Uh, there's a few venues like this that you don't see as much anymore. I remember DTM had some airports they've run. I remember they used to run on a highway even. Um, so it's always fun to go back to these kind of. Uh, unique racetracks but uh yeah in terms of dealing with traffic this race is only 10 minutes in and we already see the gt3s cutting through the gt4 field so I, I, if they're already doing it 10 minutes in they're going to be doing it constantly yeah the um as you said it's not a, it's not a particularly long track here at cleveland so that the traffic is going to come quickly and you can see there the uh, number seven car here just getting held up by the alpine but um, it, it is a very wide circuit, so you will be able to get through very quickly. It's just, you know, you're going to constantly be coming up against slower cars if you're at the front of the field. And again, as well, in that GT4 catcher, you're going to be constantly being overtaken and having your line compromised by those quicker GT3 cars. So that's something else to watch out for as well. So it's, um, it's kind of a circuit that uh, kind of just shakes up the order a bit. It's not a very traditional circuit in the sense of, well, it's literally an airport, but it's... Um, it's yeah, it's just still a it's still a very nice spectacle in terms of overtaking. If there were more cars here, it would definitely be a race to watch. But um, even with the uh, the reduced grid size and the reduced race length, it's still sure to be very exciting. Um, it's also a very forget as a you know because it is an airport. It's a very forgiving circuit. If you make a mistake, there is acres and acres of a uh, you know track width in case you're on wide. There's acres and acres of runoff because it's an airport. If you put a wall there. Uh, and, you know, if a plane tries to take off and gets a bit wrong, that could uh, be a few hundred people dead. So, uh, <laughs> there's, uh, <laughs> there's, 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 it's certainly a very forgiving circuit as well. So, uh, as well, maybe, maybe, maybe um, I mean, you, it's probably, this probably won't happen, but, you know, maybe just an idea for maybe a couple teams might be trying to field, maybe try and field some new setup ideas, maybe try and field some new, maybe just try and work on the car, work on the dress. And as I say that, that Alpine has just run very <laughs> wide out of that right-hander. But as you can see, the wall is a solid 20 meters off to the side, and he's running wide again. So um, he's, uh, he's trying to uh, get his some rallycross experience under <laughs> yeah. his belt. But um, yeah, it's it's it is it's not a traditional circuit, but it's uh, it should still still be should be. A, I can't even speak English. Sorry, it still should be quite fun. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, I mean, only uh, only 10, 15 minutes into this race so far, so still plenty to go as well. Yeah, I think there's already damage on that Alpine. So we see a yellow flag in sector three. Curious that someone would go. I guess 
the flip side of there being all the runoff in the world is uh, it really invites you to push a little bit too hard because it doesn't feel like there's any ramifications. And then you put a wheel on the grass and uh, very quickly things will fall apart. Well, I mean, as the Alpine just discovered, I mean, and obviously you want to run the grass and you've got those dirty tires as well. That's going to take time to clean those up, so that's why you run off the second time. So, yeah, you know, it, it is forgiving, but then again, as you said, yeah, it's, it's also got that sense of it. It lures you into this kind of false feeling of safety and security uh, in terms of, you know, making mistakes. So, you know, you can make mistakes, but it almost kind of forces you to make them. It's a, it's a bit of a weird one. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's just kind of the nature of the circuit, I suppose. Very much the case. It's uh, almost sort of like, a lot of those more recent Tilka tracks in F1 where there's uh, quite a lot of runoff. You want this? Oh, sure. I've been offered a sandwich. Oh, that's <laughs> very polite. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So, yeah, I mean, go ahead. It's, uh, the, the, I mean, the Tilka tracks, obviously, I mean, they're obviously custom built autodromes, you know, they're custom built often for Formula One. Um, and uh, it's. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, obviously this is similar in the sense of, you know, long, straight, heavy breakers, but it's not similar in the fact that, you know, it's an airport. Well, obviously the Tilka tracks, there's a, there's a very kind of strict formula that they follow that um, is supposed to produce racing and then yeah. more often than not actually doesn't, unfortunately. Uh, I, th I think we are going to see a bit of a change in that, actually, though, because obviously with the, uh, the COVID kind of interrupted 2020 F1 calendar, we uh, went back and visited a few kind of classic F1 uh, tracks and, you know, classic European tracks that were just a completely different design philosophy when they were designed, you know, back in the 20s, 30s. And, um, you know, and it, it was just such an amazing spectacle. And now, obviously, we've just had the announcement just in the past few days that in uh, 2023, the Russian Grand Prix is going to be heading to uh, a new track. Uh, it f escapes me where it is, but it's, uh, it's a much more kind of traditional circuit in its design philosophy so you know that's that that i guess it's it kind of holds that kind of you know long straight hard break turn in kind of philosophy of a tilka circuit because that's what they often you know you can think of all the tracks that uh you know herman tilka and his son are designed they've all got a long straight they've all got heavy braking zones they've all got kind of you know straight corner straight corner that's how they work but um and again obviously this is you know very wide so it actually manages to maintain a sort of flow to it because of how wide it is, which uh, makes it makes it quite unique. It's not often you find kind of stop-start tracks have a flow to them. Quite often they're um, you know, they're quite tricky just to kind of set into the rhythm. But here, because the track is so wide, you can really push the car out, and uh, yeah, you can really you can really find yourself in the rhythm very quickly. I'd th I think, and uh, well, well, this number 88 Munition car certainly is in the rhythm because they're flying along at the moment, yeah. rounding the uh, final corner there. So it's uh, yeah, there's there's certainly um. It's, it's different in some ways to a lot of modern circuits. It's uh, it's it's similar in other ways. Obviously, this track was last used by Champ Car back in 2007. Actually, if you look on a, a lot of the um, a lot of kind of the tents and stuff track side, it actually says Champ Car on that. That kind of bit, bit of a throwback and shows you how old this circuit is. But um, yeah, so it, maybe it's not quite as as modern as the more the kind of recent Tilka drones, but it certainly shares some of the properties. But I feel like because of how wide it is, it manages actually to pull it off very very well yeah it's a uh track that really uh invites dangerous overtaking maneuvers but uh yeah that new russian track is going to be interesting just outside of st petersburg um really anything is a improvement over the sochi autodrome though, so <laughs> i'm gonna agree with you on that one i hate that track <laughs> yeah so uh, i'll take it as a net positive no matter what it's like um yeah, there's, it's interesting. There's been quite a few tracks like that. You got the Kimi Ring in uh, Finland. Been quite a few tracks made recently for F1 that F1 doesn't visit right now, has it? So, I hopefully, mean, I, <laughs> I, I guess the purpose when you when you set about you know designing a track is the, the first kind of idea that comes ahead is kind of what do we want to host here? You know, is it going to be a national level? Is it going to be you know international GC3 or are you going to aim for Formula One? And, you know, a lot of kind of, I think a lot of kind of upstart tracks kind of, oh, you know, let, let's go for Formula One. And then, you know, they spend, you know, that's very expensive because obviously to get an FIA grade one certification, which is what a track needs in its uh, safety rating to host a Formula One Grand Prix. 
and you know, they, you know, they spend all this money and then, you know, either they don't have a budget to host a Grand Prix or F1 just, you know, it, it doesn't work for them. You know, the marketing isn't right or, you know, just, you know, they can't organize a date for it or, you know, even even sometimes they just turn and go, we don't want to hold a Grand Prix here because there is, you know, there's only so many weeks in the year and so many uh, weeks that, you know, people can go racing. You know, we have to lug everybody there and everyone to the track. And that's, for example, why they, they don't go back to Magny Corps anymore in, uh, in France, you know, which is a fantastic circuit. I'm sure many people have brilliant memories of watching the races there. But it is in the absolute middle of nowhere, and there is one road going into it and one road going out of it. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's not ideal from a logistics standpoint, which is why we now go to Paul Ricard instead. So, uh, I mean, I get... Yeah, I guess it just kind of makes sense why they don't go to such Finland and Kimi Ring, for example. Yeah, I'd love to see a Grand Prix in Finland, but the, on the logistics side of things, and it's not the weather actually, because, you know, in Finland, it's either baking hot or it's absolutely freezing. <laughs> and F1 cars aren't really designed to operate in either of those conditions. So, you know, it's just it's just an unfortunate nature that sometimes you, you just find circuits that are just in the wrong place or you, they just don't have the budget. And, as, you know, as good as some circuits are, you know, sometimes it's just not meant to be. Very true. Um, it does remind me, though, talking about uh, the baking hot and the uh, freezing cold, that uh, we have seen the WEC race in the snow. In fact, I think F1 That's raced in the snow in the yeah. 70s. Yeah, so it happens sometimes. <laughs> that was a uh, that was a pretty that was a pretty mental race to be fair. I mean, it, Spa is just one of those circuits where the weather is crazy, just because of where it is. There's also like a little fact about Spires that the weather always comes from one direction. I can never remember where it comes from, but it always hits just one point on the track first, just because that's just the direction it comes. It's like the um, the Nurburgring Nordschleife as well. You know, it's just where it is in you know the region it's in with you know the, the surrounding kind of environment. You just get crazy weather, and you know it can be. You know, at the Nurburgring as well, it's so big. You know you hear this all the time, but you can be bone dry at one end of the circuit and then torrential rain at the other end of the circuit so that's a that's a whole kind of another mind game you have to deal with but yeah that that was a pretty mental wet race that i think i, I think i remember it, yeah because it was it was it it started raining and then it started snowing and no one had a clue what was going on it was just cars were sliding off absolutely everywhere it was it was fantastic to watch i'm sure yeah. it was a nightmare to drive in <laughs> but from, from a fan kind of angle it was brilliant yeah i, I think we need to find a way to get more Top class series running in snowstorms. That's my uh, Canadian perspective on this. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad idea. I mean, I think I think we could uh, we could get NASCAR in a snowstorm. Certainly, I think that'd be a, um, an event to watch. <laughs> uh, you know, get get them back up in Canada for a race or two, and get them there in the winter. Maybe just a no points race, just you know, see how it goes. I think that'll work. Yeah, they got they already did a dirt race at Bristol. It's not that outlandish. Exactly, and then that dirt race kind of just, they kicked up all the dirt anyway, so by like the end of the first stage it wasn't a dirt race. Yeah. So, you know, if they can do a, if they can do a race in a cup car on a semi-dirt track, I'm sure they could handle a bit of snow, surely. I mean, they're professional racing drivers, their driving's what they do. Yeah. You know? They should be able to handle different conditions. That is exactly. Um, maybe it'd be a NASCAR race Bottas would be good at. Um... So as we sit here, just a side note about the race. I believe Jeff Close made a mistake because Mo Daniel Meyer is closed the gap by about three seconds in the last lap. That where I wonder if the Corvette's tires are going off. Um, could have a close battle for second here soon if that continues. We've unfortunately lost two cars already. I know Zamfer Radu, this was his first R Factor 2 race. I think he was just struggling between that and a track I'm fairly sure he's never seen in his life. And I believe Sven Gilhold was the source of our yellow in Sector 3. He had an accident. So we carry on. Five we hours, carry four on. cars. Yeah, yeah same, same about, obviously, uh, Sven Gilhold. I um, mean, Team Iris have got two cars out there today. Number 7, obviously, as you said, Jeff Close are still running P2 at the moment. But yeah, shame for that number 74 car, I'm sure, you know, especially in a four-hour race where there's so much an offer just because of the, uh, the lack of attendance from uh, from the grid. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you'd be wanting to extract the absolute most from this weekend as you possibly could. So, uh, yeah, shame for them. But Iris do still have a car in the running, so it's uh, not all doom and gloom over the, the Team Iris camp. Yeah. 
Team Iris is a team that uh, does get around the R Factor 2 endurance racing scene a lot, so... I'm sure they're just here to try out some things. They can apply in other series, get some practice in. I know they just came off a 24-hour race, too, at least, uh, the, T the duo in the number 7 car, which is an impressive feat to go from a 24-hour race to this. Just machines, that's what they are. I mean, you, you get, uh, I've, you just see people who do that. I have no idea. I've seen people do that across games before. I saw someone um do an, an endurance race in R-Factor 2 and then went and won a race in a set of course of that night. <laughs> and it was just, it was like, first of all, how would you do that in the first place? And secondly, how would you do that across two games, which in to be fast, you have to have completely different driving styles, completely different setups. One was in an LMP2 and the other one was in an F1-style car anyway, <laughs> so it was just no idea how these guys do it. Um, they're just you know, animals, frankly, just yeah. on another planet to me anyway. I, sucked. I, I struggle to be competitive in one game at a time when I have, like, weeks of practice, much less <laughs> two games without the time to really dedicate and focus on one or the other. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how we have all these driving sims that aim to be very accurate, and then they drive all completely differently. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's mainly tires, I find. Um, it's just mainly how they model the tires, and it just kind of ends up being different. I mean, R-Factor 2, a lot of the way you beat quickers in R-Factor 2, you just completely abuse the tire model. You know, it, while it is very accurate, it's also very easy to kind of get a mastery of and just, you know, while it may rip them to shreds, it also allows you to be a lot faster. I think they are trying to clamp down, though, because they've just released the um, the new uh, Class 1 BMW, uh, which is the old DTM car, which has a new tyre model on it, which, uh, which doesn't do that anymore, from what I've heard. Uh, much to the frustration of a few people in the community who've kind of mastered the art of putting on about 10 billion degrees of lock through a corner and just praying you make it. Um, and I think the plan is, is that Studio 397 are going to, you know, update a lot of the cars with this new tyre model now. So that might change kind of the uh, the front-running scene of R-Factor 2 a bit, maybe. It might change, you know, a couple of team standings, might change a couple of driver standings, you know, teams especially, because a lot of those who have kind of nailed that setup philosophy around those tyres and, you know, how the cars handle on those tyres. And now you've got a new tyre model coming in. It's uh, It does completely change things. So that could be quite interesting to watch in the near future. That's uh, all the talk and all the rage at the moment in the RF2 scene. Um, meanwhile, you know, over in Assetto Corsa, which is the other game I'm kind of really involved with, uh, they abandoned that game in 2017 and it's held together by Russian modders. So, uh, <laughs> you know, anything is possible at this point. So, but um, if anyone was interested, said Russian modders are trying to add rain to it. So there you go. That's that's something to at least look forward to if you're a fan of that game. Yeah, I've uh, been messing around with it. I went back to it a bit recently and the rain in that is incredibly impressive. Um... It's kind of shocking what you can see modders pull off, oftentimes better than the studios they're uh, based working, doing their work from. Um, yeah, the brain they're doing in the set of course is really impressive. Once the uh, handling model, once they figure out a way to make the handling impacted by the rain properly, then we'll really be uh, off to the races with that. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, once they've got the the wet tires out and working for a lot of the cars, because they've got them for a few cars, but not a lot of them. So you know, some of the, the stuff that's really so you know a lot of the GT3 cars, a lot of kind of the the Formula One mods that you can get for the game. Once they get the wet tires out and working for that, you can get a lot of visual wet tires, but no, they're actually just kind of slicks with kind of painted dots on them. Yeah. So, you know, once they get the, the wet tyre system out and running, as you said, once they make the rain actually impact how, you know, it, it ha the car handles and the, the engine works, just the physics generally work, then they uh, really could be on something. You know, bear in mind that, you know, in a set of course of competition, you know, we've probably got the best wet with this system in any game up to this point full stop and how the car reacts to the wet. Um, so, you know, you know, that's an official concept. So, if you know, if it's... If, the Kunos mods turned around and decided, you know what, we'll give a, we'll give a set of course of one last hurrah and put some wet weather in, and I'll be all for it. But uh, you know, currently the mod is doing a fantastic job anyway. So um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I mean, the mods are always working on different things in AC. You know, the, the game's always getting prettier. 
the physics are always improving. There's always more cars coming in. There's always more leagues popping up, you know, with different styles of racing. So it's um, it's interesting to see how the game develops. It's almost kind of replaced the original R factor in a sense, but yeah. how the modding scene kind of carries the game almost a bit. Because you know that that's what the original R factor was all about was you know getting mods and you know in a sense it's a lot you know you still see a lot of R factor leagues actually hanging around, which is weird for a game from like 2007 or whenever it came out. Um, you know, you still see a lot of kind of modern F1 mods and they're far more than you do on R Factor 2 just because of how easy it is to mod. Um, I feel like a set of courses kind of replaced it in that sense. And well, while the AC physics may not quite be as good as the R Factor 1 physics, you know, as if the mod is carrying a gun, I'm sure we uh, won't be far off. Yeah. That is very much the case. That, that, that it, It's keeping the game alive. I'm very interested to see. Whoa, big slide there from Julian Vrak. I'm very interested to see uh, what AC2 does to that uh, space. Um, mm. If they decide to keep modding supported, or if they're going to go with the ACC route and make it a little bit more of a polished, tighter experience. Um, fingers crossed for modding, but uh, you don't really know. I mean, obviously I I'd love for it to be you know, an ACC experience with other cars in, because ACC is, you know, on the physics front, is, you know, arguably, I'd say it's on about the same level as R Factor 2 when it's not being abused. And obviously then you have the wet weather, which is just phenomenal. The graphics are also amazing. Uh, um, but, you know, obviously it's held back and by the limitation that because it is an official game, of you know several GT series, they can't really allow mods into that. It's the same kind of story with the F1 games. You know, it's very tricky to mod the F1 games. You know, apart from you know skins. Uh, it, it, you know, there are, there are a few good mods out there. To be fair, you know, someone managed to work out a dirty air mod that works properly, which is amazing. And someone actually managed to figure out a, a, a mod that actually gives you, uh, gives you a puncture if you run over debut as well, which is really clever. But that is about as far as it goes. You know, there's no track mods. There's no car mods. And there's no, you know, engine sounds or this or that or whatever. It's um, it really is just kind of held back because it's an official game, and obviously, you know, when you've got an official title, you can't really, you know, you have to kind of say sorry, you can't touch this. Um, so hopefully, you know, I don't even know what, what the devs are doing at the moment. They may be making an AC2. They may be doing another thing entirely. Um, but yeah, hopefully, I, I mean, I would like kind of an ACC experience with all cars. But then again, at the same time, I, I don't think that's the right move. I think it would kind of be more, a more similar thing to, you know, take things from ACC that work for the, the wet weather, for example, and the, you know, the tyre model, which is very good. Um, and then, you know, maybe build a new engine off of that instead of just completely take ACC. Because if they just take ACC and add cars to it, you know, it will drive fantastically, I'm certain. But... You know, it's um, it's gonna stop a lot of people having a lot of fun with mods, for example, and you're basically gonna be stuck with what's in the base game. Yeah. Just for a note, they actually did announce it's coming out in 2023 AC2, so we did know they? it's happening. Yeah. Oh, I missed that one completely. Yeah. It's they basically said it's happening, and then that was all we know about it, and then they quietly walked away. It yeah, like... it's happening. <laughs> there you are. Well, um... you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> AC2 is in fact happening. And that's all we're telling you. That's all we're telling you. Um, yeah, so here we sit, about half an hour in. That battle between the Mugen number 88 and the Team Iris number 7 continues. It's very interesting. Jeff will extend the lead about uh, almost half a second in the first two sectors and will lose it all in the third, and then the gap stabilizes again. Um, mm. Completely could just be down to where the cars are stronger on the track. Could be that Daniel's a little bit braver on the brakes into the final chicane. Because that final chicane is really the only part of the track where you can wreck the car. Um, yes. Everywhere else, you can go way off. But in that final chicane, it's very easy to lose it. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's where the balls are closest to the track. and it's, uh, It is a very tight chicane that... You know, in a, in, a, in a sim, you know, tight chicanes aren't really a thing. You could just kind of bomb through them and pray you don't hit anything. Because, <laughs> you know, you don't have a, a floor to protect because floor damage isn't really simulated. 
So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot, that chicane is a lot quicker in Sim than it would have been in real life. But it's also, you know, where the walls are close to the trap, which, you know, in real life, you would have been going a lot slower through there here. You know, you're bombing through in third, maybe fourth gear if you're feeling very keen. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a, a bit more impactful if you make a mistake, shall we say. Yeah, for sure. It's a uh, risk management, we'll say. Especially when it's a four-hour race with this few cars in a championship race, you're like... Yes, I want to push and get that next car. Very true. Flip side of it, if I can just come home here with points in third, or second, you know, that's still third or second place points. Um, and that could be very decisive in the long run of a championship. Mm. Speaking of I mean, which... Go ahead, Again, sorry. though, from the other angle, because there's so little cars on track... You know, while you could just sit there and, you know, get points, you know, if you can push, you may as well, because more points is going to be more impactful on the championship. So it's it's kind of a, a, a mind game of what the teams do. Do you, you know, take a conservative, just go, yep, yeah, we'll sit here, we'll take the points home. You know, it's a four-hour race as well. Our stints have been reduced. It's, not, it's less stress on us as a driver. It's less stress on us as a team. We can just take this very easy, come home, get some decent points. Or do you go... Yeah, you know, those points will be decent, but because there's so little cars out there today, if we, you know, push and get just that one more place, that's even more points in an already impactful race. So, you know, it's all what you do. And it, even even though the race has been reduced, it's still four hours. That's still an endurance race. So, you know, you know, you do need to keep an eye on your fuel, your tires, your your fatigue as a driver as well. You know, you, you've got to stay focused. I'm, I'm not expecting driver fatigue to come in that much now. This race is four hours. Or it's still six hours, I'd still be, you know, kind of teaching on, yeah, you know, towards the end of their stints, the drivers may be making a few mistakes here. And because it's only two, you know, probably a two hour stint per driver now, I'm uh, not really expecting that to come in. But it's just an another factor that is possible. Yeah. And um, another thing that I've seen come up recently as well, I think um, a lot of places in the, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere are suffering some, uh, some hot weather at the moment. And that's actually starting to, to play with a, 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 I think I found it's especially come with Thrustmaster wheelbases as well. Uh, any Thrustmaster kind of belt driven wheelbases are just really not enjoying the heat. And then you're getting a lot of force feedback fade quite early on into races as a result of the heat. So that could be such an exterior factor to worry about as well. I know um, I was, I was doing a commentary on another race a couple of weeks back and one of the drivers in there we interviewed in post race. And he just said, you know, I didn't have any force feedback after the second lap because Jeez. my wheel just overheated and he's got the fan on you know on override as well which shouldn't be doing that but it's just so hot out there at the moment they just can't handle it so um yeah that's that could be another factor to think about as well i, d I don't know if any drivers out there are running thrust master wheel bases but if they are you know given the, the current heat wave situation that we've all got going on uh, in europe and i believe over in western america as well uh it could uh, could get a bit spicy for some of them out there uh, later on into the day yeah, that is certainly something to consider. It would be very cool. This is a... Uh, I know nobody from Studio 397 is watching, but let's just imagine they were for a moment. Um, it would be very cool if there was a way to know what wheelbases people are using. Um, almost like a manufacturer information, but for wheelbases, because that's kind of... Uh, one of the most noteworthy pieces of kit. Like, one of the most important points of failure in any setup. Um, technically, in sim racing. It would almost be like having access to the engine information in real racing. Um, you know, if someone's running the Honda or the Mercedes or the Chevrolet engine. Um, yeah, it would be very cool. But yeah, in my bedroom, I ran an industrial fan last night because it was that hot. Uh, so, wow, that is, that is warm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm in Canada, man. But it's like, it's, it's in, it's uh, mid, uh, high 30s with the humidity here today, so. Wow. Yeah. That will cook the wheelbase quick. Yeah, that's gonna um gonna lead to some pretty unhappy pieces of electronic equipment. That will, especially you know, if you're using it aggressively, if you're running higher force feedback as well, it's just gonna happen even quicker. Um, and that that's part of the beauty. I don't know. Again, I don't know if anyone out there's running a direct drive wheel, but that's part of the beauty of a direct drive wheel is you don't really get that. Um, it's much more prevalent with a, a, a belt-driven wheelbase, which is what makes up the majority of the uh, wheelbase market and user base. 
So, yeah, that's uh, another advantage of uh, direct drive wars. But then again, not all of us have around a thousand quid lying around in our back pocket to spend on our hobby. So, yeah, you know, that's uh, <laughs> pretty unfortunate. <laughs> um, I, I certainly wouldn't mind having a direct drive war base, but, you know, that's a lot of money. So... Yeah, um, I mean, we'll see, we'll see how technology develops in the future. I mean, obviously, we know that Fanatec are bringing their um, CSL direct drive wheel out in the near future, which is sure to be a game changer, I'm certain. Uh, you know, bringing a, a direct drive wheel to a, a kind of a general affordable market price is uh, it's definitely a, an aggressive move from the Fanatec team. Um, and I think, actually, I think it really could be changing the face of the sim racing wheel market because if they're doing that, then, you know, people like Thrustmaster, I'm sure, won't be far behind with their own variant. Um, you know, give it a couple of years and it could be basically direct drive all around us. So uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see how that ha works out. But, you know, it could be very much a changing sim racing landscape we're looking at as sim racing, you know, continues to grow especially after, you know, how big you got during 2020 with the pandemic and basically every real-world racing driver going, hey, this, this thing that we pretended didn't exist is cool now. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, and now we've got this as well. It's, it's certainly just... It's, it's, a change, it's a changing world. It's a changing market. Um, and it's... Uh, yeah, it should, it should be interesting to see how it evolves over the next few years, I think. Yeah, I am... Uh... I think everyone was a little bit disappointed when Thrustmaster's new wheel turned out to be a TGT2 that was belt-driven, but I imagine they were caught unawares by the Fanatec DD and didn't think that sort of things were going. So hopefully, by the time I have money and uh, <laughs> to buy things like that, there'll be a Thrustmaster uh, equivalent. Um, just a quick note about the race. Uh, the Mugen, which I've sort of been keeping an eye on the lap times, had a few laps about a second and a half off the pace. They've gotten back on the horse again, but uh, it's lost them about four seconds to the uh, Team Iris car in front. Don't know what the cause of that was. Must have ran into all the GT4 cars on the same lap. And just messed them up, I'm not sure. Just had a few rough laps getting the wheels in the grass. Trying to push a bit too hard either way back on the horse now um yeah i'm i'm really hoping uh thrustmaster thrustmaster did get the load cell pedals out hopefully there'll be a dd to match and we'll have a good fight at the top at the uh mid end of the sim racing market soon enough i mean hopefully yeah but i mean uh, banatech have just played their cards perfectly here i think because you know thrustmaster are going oh we've got this new wheel coming out this new this new rim coming out even you're gonna love it. Uh, you know, it's a Ferrari rim that works, that only currently works on one game, <laughs> with like only above a wheelbase that's like seven hundred dollars. So that was everyone was kind of like, yeah, cool, but you know, and then if Fanatec come out, you know, just pull their trousers down, <laughs> put their kids on the table, and go, you know, just out of absolute nowhere, like there, there was no hyping up about the announcement. Because you know, Thrustmaster gone. Yeah, for this new room coming. You know, this is. You know, there was a, there was a, a leak. I think of it as well. At one point, it was just kind of everyone was talking about. It. And then Fanatec come along, bang, direct drive wheel. You know, going for like three hundred and fifty euros for the base price. You know, that is just the wheel base. Granted, you will need to buy a rim as well. So that'll be another you know hundred euros at least. But that is just such a power move I've ever seen one. They've just. You know, come along, just demolished Thrustmaster's hopes and dreams. <laughs> um, I'm sure. I'm sure that Thrustmaster are absolutely scrambling now to come up with their own design for this because this is, you know, this is possibly an absolute killer for them because you know, Fanatec have just come along and just completely. Like I said, you know, they're going to change the shape of the market completely, and you know, Thrustmaster have just not seen that coming, and they're going to miss out on a very nice piece of the pie because by the time they come up with their design, you know. A lot of people are going to be running the Fanatec, you know, yeah. CSL DD, and you know, what's their alternative going to be? What what are they going to offer in a direct drive wheel that uh, Fanatec don't? Um, so yeah, that's, it's certainly interesting, especially for how Thrustmaster will respond, and um, you know how Fanatec just grows from this. I mean, I I run a Thrustmaster wheel myself, but I've got a set of Fanatec pedals. And uh, I won't say anything, but I think you can probably guess which one I think are the better quality out of the two. 
So, um, yeah, it's certainly uh, interesting for the future of the market, interesting for the future of uh, Thrustmaster. And, um, interesting for the, you know, what what kind of sim racers recognize as brands as well. I mean, especially for new people coming in as well, you're not going to know what a direct drive and a wheelbase is. You're not going to go any of that stuff. You know, you're going to ask, around, oh, what wheel should I get? And, you know, people are going to go, well, if you've got anything above, you know, above this budget, you know, this is, you know, the best technology you can get for a very reasonable price. Yeah, and that that's going to be a lot of people, you know, buying that wheel. It's, it's it is an absolute power move by the Fanatec. I think it really could be a game changer for them. Yeah, it's uh, very cool to see that happening. I know, uh, but yeah, I, I, it'll be tough for Thrustmaster to respond just because direct drive wheels aren't really their thing. But uh, yeah, you see, even funny, they they got their fancy Ferrari wheel, and then Fanatec brought out that ridiculously crazy bentley wheel the next oh the month. thing that looks like it's got like an ipad in the middle of it yeah <laughs> that can be used as a wall clock i thought that was a joke it actually can be used as a clock when it's not on the wheelbase um so i don't know i mean I, I, again that's that's the that's the second real world collaboration that fanatec has had now as well yeah. that's another thing they've got um you know because they had the uh, bmw room which they did and um, now they've got the benefit. I mean, obviously, the the rim that's used in the real car is going to be a, maybe a bit more well made, a bit you know made out of much nicer materials. Ooh, there's been a certain. big oh, incident. Wheel. Yeah, that is a that uh, that's the Musion BMW it's just clipped and a bit of front ends come off it as well. All right, guys, I we're gonna go to code it. We're gonna go to a yellow flag here. So when right. the 818 gets to the front stretch, can you please go to the pit limiter and we'll have everyone form up behind you. All right, so yeah, caution is out as you can hear because uh, we've got Christian running the other <laughs> stewarding side of things as well. Caution! I think that was the Iris Corvette. It is, yeah, that was Jeff Closer who's coming to the pits. So I don't know what's happened there. I think he's just, uh, you know, giving it a bit too much throttle, coming out of the uh, penultimate right hander and just slid into the outside wall. And um, yeah, that's interesting. Well, we'll have a, um, a kind of a caution restart here, but I'm not entirely sure what's happened. We won't get a replay either because the R Factor 2 replay button is broken. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you can just see him there just in the distance crawling down the pit lane. That's, yeah, my best assumption is he's just tried to push too hard, you know, coming through that right hander and he's just absolutely clobbered the outside wall and somehow lost a wheel. All right, Marcel, so can you go to the pit limiter here? Thank you very much. So just look for that black Bentley on the front straight. Yeah, there is so, a black Bentley on the front straight. There you go. Um, yes, what was I going to say? So, big deal in the race in terms of uh, how things will it'll tighten everything up, put everyone closer together again. Um, yeah, certainly a cool thing about CERT is the safety cars. It keeps the races tighter. Hopefully it will help put some life back into this one. Um, but yeah, in terms of... Uh, Replays in R Factor 2. I figured out a way to do it for uh, Visc, but it's uh, not going to work well today just because I have to do the stewarding. But there is a way to do it. It's incredibly clunky. I am not happy with how you have to do it. Um, I wish that replay button... Because it seems like the way they want it to work. For, I'm going to give you some... Uh, everyone who's watching. Anyone who ends up watching. A little bit of a behind-the-scenes knowledge here about how the overlay system works. So there, you have your control panel. And on the control panel, there's a very cool button that lets you mark important events for replays. So it seems like the idea is you could mark an event for a replay, like a timestamp, click on the car that was involved, hit the replay button, and then it will play from the timestamp. And then there's a go-to-live feed button, right? Which would imply then after that's happened, you can bump to the live feed. Sounds brilliant. None of it does anything right now. In fact, I'm not sure it's ever done anything. <laughs> nice. So, very well-intentioned. That's all I can say. Um, yeah, I don't know. Still in the pits, Jeff Close. I imagine that was a monstrous accident. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna take a while to repair, I think. Yeah. I uh, was watching the lap times, and he had lost about four seconds to Meyer in the Mugen 88 car. 
over the net, over the two laps. So I wonder if a tire was going down. So we see Marcel take the uh, pit lane. So Daniel, you're now the leader. So for the Alpines, look for the BMW, that kind of silver blue BMW. Well, I didn't think you'd ever hear the man running race control also leading to the comms, but there you go. <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit of insight for all you watching. Um, I mean, I've, uh, I did the lead, well, it's, uh, it's not really a th well, the lead kind of killed over and died, but, um, yeah, over, over at VMG, we did actually have a functioning replay, and it was, I have no idea how they actually got it to work, but they managed to connect basically two OBSs. Um, they had two people on cameras, one on the replay, one, you know, on the live broadcast. And then the one running the live broadcast would somehow switch the stream over to the replay OBS on another computer, and it would broadcast the replay from there, and then it would switch back. And I have no idea how that worked, but it did. It was amazing. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen from a broadcast team, and I cannot thank Joey and Seb Shu enough for that. But just whatever black magic they were running <laughs> on that OBS system was unreal. It was just the most... I still can't... I, on it, think about it now, I still can't figure out how they did it. It was amazing. I need to ask, probably, because it was just amazing. got to steal that black magic for Visk. Um, I mean, you probably could if you want. I mean, I'm on the... Uh, I'm, on, I'm on the Visk commentary team now as well, so I could uh, I could go in and ask if they... Uh, they need a, need a cheat. I could I could like kind of go up to them and give them a nudge, be like, hey, hey, do, do, do you want some replay cameras? You know? Yeah. You so Jeff, what? you can uh, just go around and get your lap back. Just do it safely here. Just hold to the outside and let Jeff close through, please. There we go. I've stolen the NASCAR lucky dog rule to try and <laughs> save these situations. <laughs> um, lucky dog out of five cars. I know. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's a very, uh, some people love this and some people hate it. It's, uh, an interesting thing to try and balance. I've heard people be incredibly appreciative of it, and I've heard people tell me that it's the biggest mistake I've made. So we'll see <laughs> who's right. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I actually quite like the lucky dog rule. I think it just shakes it up a bit. So it could work, you know? I think yep. it would it'd certainly be interesting to see how it goes, so... Okay, so the current situation is such that the leader has pulled off. Okay, so Ryan, you're actually the leader of the field, so just go to the pit limiter and catch those uh, Alpines, if you will. So just stay on the pit limiter, let the Alpines form up behind you. There you go. And we somehow pit. lost track of who's in the lead in the five car event. That's really poor from us, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so I know Ryan, it makes sense he's in the lead, because before the pit cycle he was in the lead. Um, then Daniel inherited the lead because he uh, decided to uh, do an extra lap while Ryan, well, it wasn't Ryan in the car. He's in the car now, took over that Bentley. Um, the 515. Anyways, yeah, so Bentley in the lead. Ryan with hey, yo, we've regained you. track of who's leading the race. Yeah, theoretically it should be. Lap. Yeah, theoretically it should be him. It, another issue. I don't know if this was mentioned to you, but we discovered pretty much 15 minutes before the race that the pit lane on this track is not made properly. Um, so we'll see how it ends up cycling everyone through here. But it seems to uh, miscount the laps. Woof. Oh, nice. Oh, and that's someone going the wrong way. <laughs> was that a car going down the wrong the lane way? Straight backwards. Oh, boy. That would have been bad. Uh, so, just Daniel, you can gun it and catch up to the field. Don't feel the need to stay on the pit limiter. There you go. And he's Every off. Yeah, everyone's uh, used to uh, Code 80s, which every R Factor League runs. And I know with this, Alex is very. Uh, anal about people staying on it, so... 
No, I mean to be fair, I've 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 been the cause of it. Well, it wasn't entirely my fault. I got turned across, <laughs> but I was the car that was the cause of the code eight because I was limping around without a rear wing once. Yeah. Like I didn't hear the code eight when I just seen my rear view mirror just an LMP2 get absolutely annihilated by DPI. He was just going full pace. Yeah. Um, it was quite funny. It still is funny to be fair. I'm sure. <laughs> just kind of just kind of looking in your mirror and just seeing two prototypes flying through the air. As you're like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, that was, um, yeah, I mean, Code 80s, uh, it, I know a lot of people do get quite, you know, kind of annoyed about it, especially if people don't slow down in time. That's one of the the tricks. I mean, in real life, yeah, you do have to slow down or you get a penalty because, you know, it's the regulations. A lot of time in sim racing, a lot of people don't because they think they can get away with it. Yeah. They, they try and leave it as late as possible. And then, uh, and then everyone gets a bit annoyed about that because that's just, you know, how the cookie crumbles, I suppose. Wouldn't, wouldn't so I'm going to let the GT3s complain. just get in front of those GT4s. We'll go green next time, bye. Go green again. Here we go. Yeah. All righty. Race is back on. Why right, is Jeff stopping on the track, slowing down? He lose drive? Maybe. No, he's still going. I don't know. He's just... Ah, uh, fuel, maybe? I can hear that engine running. Very curious. Why is he hanging back? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, he's stopping. He's just grinding to a hole, I think. Oh. Nope. Very going straight as well, so maybe he's had a, uh, a wheel disconnect, maybe? Because he's just going straight from the angle he was on when he started to slow. Yeah. Very curious that. I don't even... Nope. Uh, yep, yeah, just grinding to a halt. That is very strange. Yeah, it was. The engine's off in that car. Maybe he's out of fuel. Okay, so we have a stopped car on the entry to turn three on the outside. Let's find out. Let's do some detective work here. Channel switched. Oh. Okay. All right. C'est la vie. Game crashed. Oh, game crashed. Okay. If you want to rejoin, I'll well, give you the lap back. Well, it didn't crash. It just my screen just froze. I oh. saw my car was. I heard. I heard my car was moving. I saw my car was moving on the track map, but I didn't see myself moving. <laughs> I had this, like, a screen freeze, like I saw the GT in GT4 of Julian, I was like, uh, hello? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, nah, keep going. Yeah, if, I... you, if you come back, I'll give you the laps back. Nah, I can't be honest anymore. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Well, have a good one then, man. Uh, you too, man. Channel switched. Okay, so this computer, cr that was a game, cr that was a oh, wow. car factor crash. Okay, so we're going to go good. green here. And then after this uh, corner, you can go green when you want, Ryan. So, he's, so hopefully he'll be able to get back in, but that's bizarre. But we're yeah. uh, back on the green flag anyway. Um, yeah, there you go. Race is off again. There go the GT3s. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a matter. That is weird. Yeah, I have no idea what the cause of that was. Let me get rid of that. Yeah, as a uh, brief bit of chaos there. Man, for a race with so few cars, the attrition is incredibly high. <laughs> I mean, we're what, an hour in? And uh, we've lost three out of the seven cars already. Um, so yeah, at this rate, we'll have no runners left by... I'd give it about an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, we'll <laughs> go home early. <laughs> I'll uh, get in that... Uh, Plus 35 degree sun. Um, oh, was not that lovely? I'll go and, um... I don't know what I'll do. Something or other. Something or other. It's Peter Schooneman who's in here. I imagine that is because... The TeamSpeak whisper isn't working for him. So it isn't working for some people and was working for others. That is... Man, this is why I usually leave commentating to myself. Or leave myself to commentate. Um... Here we go. 
battle is on again for GT4, and in GT3 it's even closer. Just half a second split, splitting the two cars. I mean, this is for the race lead in both categories. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a two-car category for the two categories. So uh, yeah. this is for two race leads at the same time. So it is actually quite interesting what's going on here. Yeah. Um, currently, that Bentley in the lead is just holding firm. I mean, it's uh, it's a bit of a rocket ship in a straight line is the Bentley. I've, um, I've seen them in real life at Silverstone. Those things are quick despite their size. And he's uh, uh, currently just holding station in the lead is Ryan Whitlock and uh, Daniel May is doing everything he can in the Musion 88 but you know there's only so much you can do you could just see how quick it is in Australia it's just pulling away it's unbelievable obviously that with the uh, the BOP of GT3 cars the Bentley's allowed a lot of extra power because of how heavy it is and um, it really does use that to its advantage down the longer straights it is just so so fast when it wants to be uh, oh, that was very close between the Musion car and the Bentley. Oh, that was that was probably not fun for both drivers there. I think uh, Mayer just hit the brakes a little bit too late. But uh, they're still going around for the time being. And again, just very aggressive from May. He's just looking for the gaps, trying to send it down the inside from miles back. I don't know if he thinks he's turned into Daniel Ricciardo or something. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's some very aggressive moves, but it's certainly making some fantastic viewing. Yeah, it's great to see close racing given the context. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I think it's as you said, the Bentley, it does have the heft on the straights. And this is a track with quite a lot of long straights. But in exchange, much weaker in the braking than that BMW. Oh, a bit squirrely. The other thing to consider is Ryan was not the guy who started in that Bentley. He just got into that car and is immediately being put under pressure by Mayer, who's probably warmed up and ready to go after doing that first hour. Now he's got a fresh set of boots and he's all over that Bentley looking to try and flip the script of this race as we hit the three hours to go mark. Oh, is that a dive? Oh, that is a big dive from the Musion BMW. They're gonna go straight through to the lead. That's a lovely move through turn one. All oh, the Bentley's trying to fight back though. And as you said, with that extra power, it's just rocketed out of the acceleration zone. It's going to have the inside line into turn three, and it's going to try and retake the lead. Will the music car hold firm? I think it will. It's going to have the inside line once again, Daniel Meyer. No, maybe. I don't know the Bentley is so <laughs> quick down the straight. Ritlock now having another look to the inside Ooh. line. Oh, there's contact between the pair. There is contact between the pair of them. Round goes Meyer and the BMW. And Willow will re-inherit the lead, and now that's going to be one angry driver at the wheel of that BMW. He's going to be chasing down that Bentley. And we can take a breather for the next five minutes or so. He did momentarily have the lead, but now, well, my back down to second out of two. That is never what you want to see in this racing. Uh, so close together. Only lost six seconds, and if he's faster, he'll make it up. Still incredibly frustrating. I don't know if I'll have a choice, but I, I feel like I have to give Ryan a penalty of some sort for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. The, so here's the problem. Re-enter the problem with the track I mentioned earlier with the uh, pit lane. Is Normally I'd say, okay, I guess I have to give you a drive through. You haven't really given me much of a choice. But the problem is the pit lane here is bugged. So if I give you a drive through, you actually are going to lose a lap. Um, which is way more destructive than I'd want. So I have to think we have to... A, a 10 second stop go. He has to sit in the pits for 10 seconds next time when he goes yeah. for a pit stop. That... See, this is why we keep you around. This is why we pay you the big bucks. Of course, the whole, hey, do you want to come and do this? This is in that next time. It's okay if you can't make it. That's how much I get paid. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I... I've, I've very quickly transitioned from commentator to co-steward by the sounds of things. There you are. <laughs> More than happy to help out. Um, yeah, that's just my suggestion. Okay, so we're going to have to give a 10-second stop and go at the next pit stop for the number 818 for causing a collision. So at the next pit stop, that will be a 10-second hold. So there we go. There you go. Brilliant. ACC has that built in, which is very convenient. R Factor 2 does not, unfortunately. No, you're just uh, going to have to time him in the pits, I think. Yep. Just how it works. Yep. That's fine. We've got a stopwatch. 
You gotta stop. Watch, I got my phone. It's 2021. We have the technology. Um, yeah, it'll be great. It'll be uh, really good to have uh, a lot of voices together for the 24 Hours of Daytona that Visk will be putting on soon. It'll be great to have you there. Hopefully, uh, our good Scottish friend can avoid falling off bikes before that race <laughs> as well. <laughs> that would be um, ideal. That would be ideal. Hopefully get uh, everyone together. Tommy. Uh, Tom Dillon, maybe. Yeah, I think we got a few people we can hopefully get together and make that there's a, a proper yeah, there's event. There's a media team over at Risk, so there's certainly uh, a lot of people, a lot of very, very good commentators that I'm sure will be taking us the whole way through those that 24-hour event. Yeah. And uh, making everyone watched feel loved and like <laughs> they're watching an actual motor race. Yeah. My hope is always to ensure with this that there's never a uh, period where there's no commentator, and I try to ensure nobody's alone. That's my uh, two biggest goals. <laughs> it's oh hard to achieve. Oh my goodness me! But... Can you just work with me all the time now? <laughs> it's like it's like every it's like every time when I'm alone, it's like oh, uh, mm, mm. It yeah. It's very frustrating very quickly. Especially if the race is dull, because you just, I, like, half the I just sit there on my phone, if I'm going to be brutally honest. There has been a, a lot of races where I just have just given up paying attention, because nothing <laughs> is going on. I'm on my, there's no one to talk to. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can get away with that, because, you know, it's sim racing, it's not like an actual commentary job where I, I'm getting, like, paid to, you know, actually sit there and talk about it. But that, that, I do actually feel very sympathetic. Uh, the guy who uh, has Formula Renault European Cup, Powered by Alpine, Frecker is it's effectively known by everybody now. Uh, Chris McCarthy, he's a fantastic commentator, but he's on his own. And he just sounds so bored every race. <laughs> you know, he, he just has nobody to talk to. And I, I do feel for the man because you know it's it must be tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, thank you for having that in the back of your mind. That is the best thing that anyone has ever said to me <laughs> in a sim racing broadcast. Thank you. Um, I try. Um, yeah, that was a, um, yeah, that was the goal always with Visk. And it was easy for the sprints, because I could just, like, have my friend Matt just come on, and we just, like, you know, we're IRL friends, so we just, like, chat. And it was good, um, but I think Matt's gonna have work a lot of the races now, so I gotta recreate the magic with a whole new group of people. Um, but I think it'll be good. Um, I hate to hype Visk too much, but, <laughs> I don't hate to hype Visk too much. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. I like IMSA racing, and uh, I just wish it was at a time that was better for us in North America sometimes, because getting up at 7 a.m. to get everything ready can be, uh, oof, can be a bit. Um, Ims, IMSA's great. I yeah. love IMSA. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm really excited to see how the, uh, LMDH and LMH sort of work together. Yeah, should be interesting. Because uh, that's uh, sort of the big... I remember Glickenhaus was sort of taking shots at the uh, companies that had chosen the uh, LMDH rule set over LMH, but given the uh, LMH cars are not much faster than the LMP2s, it would seem like uh, they're in a similar boat. In terms of pace. Especially the Glickenhaus car, which appears to have the straight line speed of a dog, so yeah. You know. <laughs> so I, that, I don't I know Jim won't be watching, but that my, my group of friends we have a we have a particular thing that's against Jim Glickenhaus, so um <laughs> I can get away with saying this because I know Jim isn't watching this. Um yeah, we don't like him, basically, so uh, any opportunity we have to uh, you know, get on his nerves a bit, we'll take that. So <laughs> <laughs> It's it it but it's not a good car. I mean, it's they they turn up to Portimao and we're just so far off the base. It was yeah. almost embarrassing. I was really um, hoping Glickenhaus would bring back that Pano's early two thousands energy, but it doesn't seem like that's where it's going. I'm just excited for next year too, to be honest, because that's when all the uh, all the new manufacturers and we've got Porsche coming back, Audi's coming back, Peugeot are coming back. Someone else is coming. Like all the, the everyone who left for Formula E is now leaving Formula E to come back to WEC. So I'm I'm all for it, frankly. I also don't like Formula E that much. <laughs> so 
not not to be rude to it i just I, it doesn't appeal to me the uh, i don't enjoy the racing I, w I went to the last formula e race they had in london and it's the most boring motorsport event i've ever watched in person so you know Oof. it was just very dull and it was a title decider as well so that kind of sums up the entire series for you but um yeah it's um it's, it's nice to see the world insurance championship gaining some traction again because GT is dying. The top class has been around for about three races and has already seems destined to fail at the rate it's going. LMP2 is just people who have no money, so it never really gets anywhere. I mean, it's like, like I know we're talking about IMSA, but IMSA genuinely does a better job of like being a good endurance league than the, the world endurance chat. I don't quite get it, but yeah. It's, it's even the entire... I don't know how much you followed the development of the LMH versus DPI 2.0 rule set, but that was such a fascinating dichotomy of how the two series are different. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, what happened basically was IMSA and the WEC both said they are going to do a new top class roughly around the same time. I think IMSA came out first with DPI 2.0, and then the WEC came out with uh, LMH. Or a hypercar. Yeah, so LMH, Le Mans hypercar. And immediately, IMSA had like six companies on board. And nobody was committing to hypercar. Um, so, oof, as we see, Meyer getting held up by the Alpine a little bit. Loses about two seconds there, just in one corner. Um, but yeah. So you have hypercar. Almost nobody now joins. I mean, I think... DPI 2.0 had three or four manufacturers pretty much from the get-go. So then the WEC came to IMSA to see if they could like merge the two classes together, which IMSA happily got on board with, fortunately. But it's interesting now because it almost compromises the hypercar concept because now you know the hypercars, which are significantly more expensive, are going to be balanced to be the same pace as the... the uh, Daytona as the LMDH cars. So I don't know how that will... It, it, it kind of uh, represents, I think, the uh, core of the issue in terms of how the two series approach uh, getting manufacturers on board. I mean, the World Endurance Championship, since its conception in 2011, has been gradually just slowly falling to pieces ever since. So, you know... Endurance racing is, I mean, it's a hard format to market because, you know, it's it requires people, you know, to sit down and watch races for a long time. It was hard to get it from a fan perspective. And then it's hard to please anybody from, you know, the manufacturer perspective because, you know, all well, everyone's turning up, that's great and all, but, you know, you've got to put BOPs in to make sure it's equal and then everyone gets upset about it. And obviously when the Formula E turned up as well, it just completely killed the top clock NMP1. Yeah. Just completely. Um, so it's, it, it is it is a tough kind of thing to market. It, I, I think it just does a bit better in IMSA than it does in the World Endurance Championship for some reason. I'm not quite sure why, but I feel like IMSA just naturally... I don't know, I think it's just because of it's it's just variety because obviously America is so dominated by oval racing. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, you know a series that doesn't really touch ovals is just you know a breath of fresh air almost. So it, do, it does very well there, yeah. and I mean IMSA, IMSA, IMSA is always great to watch as well. You know the the quality of driving is great. You know the cars are always great. It's it's just great. I mean there's there's an IMSA race going on right now. I mean. I, I watched the first corner and there was an immediate crash. <laughs> and I, I laughed and then. But yes, yeah, so, no, it wasn't. It was before the first corner. Someone locked the rear brakes going into turn one at Watkins Glen and put themselves in the wall, and that was that really. But um, <laughs> you know, it just it just has that. You know, I, I I can't quite explain it, but it just kind of almost has. It has that that little extra something. It has that that sauce that the the WEC just almost seems like it doesn't have from a, a, a spectator's point of view. Like when you think of you know special WEC race, you know you think of maybe that one Spa race where it snowed. And then you think of Le Mans. Mm -hmm. That's basically it. Well, you know, and also the graphics package is awful on the stream, on, so it kind of makes it difficult to watch because your eyes can hardly can see <laughs> what looks like it was made by a five-year-old in 1987. But you know, IMSA it's slick. 
you know, all the races feel special because there's, you know, there's such a brilliant variety of road courses in North America that they go to, and it just feels special. And, you know, the competitiveness of the field is brilliant, and the top class is actually functional, and it's just brilliant. I love it. It's so good. Yeah, I, I think that's a massive part of it. Is there's enough cars in the top class? <laughs> um, that helps. I I I didn't watch WEC enough back in the uh, heydays of LMP1, but. See Ryan Whitlock. What was the middle sector? So this is a interesting. Um, this has sort of been the one very interesting part of this race for me has been watching the sector times and seeing how the different GT3 cars are stronger and significantly weaker at different parts of the track. Mm. Um, it's interesting. At the start of the stint, Daniel Meyer was about a second a lap faster than Ryan, but it seems Ryan has uh, warmed up and found the pace and stabilized it. He's still slowly being reeled in but not by the heaps and bounds that he was at the start of his stint so starting to get a uh, handle on things I feel like I'm watching a uh... you remember the movie Cars <laughs> <laughs> in the final race at the end where they do the like 500 lap race with three cars yeah that is this that is what this feels like <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess in a sense. I mean, the, the whole plot of Cars is, um, it's, it, I do love the film, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting one. Because, I mean, <laughs> that it would never happen. Because it's, it's, I mean, it's a film about a race car that gets kidnapped and then, like, winds up in the middle of nowhere and learns about friendship and then has a three-way tiebreaker race in NASCAR, when the entire point is there's literally 40 cars on the track. So, but I also did watch that film religiously as a child, can quote it word for word <laughs> up to about three quarters of the way through the movie, um, which I can do. I won't do it on stream so I don't get copyrighted, <laughs> but if anyone wants me to quote it word for word at some point, I will, because I can. Uh, it's it's my I guess it's my party trick of uh, making people leave me alone for the rest of the night. Um, it is it, I, I kind of get where you're coming from. It's um, I mean the final race is great as well, and you get to hold you see the cool right to go left thing, and then you get to see you know the the king's crash, and it's like, and lightning learns the value of friendship by giving up a championship for some reason, which all he had to do was you know cross the line and then turn around but you know i still love it it's great i love it yeah one of those uh man that was the fact that movie is so old now rick hurts me um because so i remember seeing that in theaters it's traumatizing to think of childhood movies you saw in theaters becoming old movies um anyway <laughs> as we carry on Let's find out. I've added a cool new thing to the overlay. Number of stops. That's actually been there the whole time. Everyone's done one stop. I was hoping... Here's here's another one to add our fact. This is another Studio 397 thing I want. Um, could you give us an option to see when they pit? Ooh, I, uh... Like a strategy window. Yeah. So that, that's a big thing when I'm, like, doing, um... So I sometimes do ACC commentary on races, and I have the Race Sync app. So what I can actually and this and ACC doesn't show this either. They really should, but the Race Sync app shows you how many pit stops they've done and when they last pit. So you can start to piece together what the ranges are for different teams on like fuel and tire wear, uh, and it gives you a sense of the strategy, and you can start of putting together a picture of how the race is going to work. Um, very cool thing, should add, would be appreciated. If you're listening to Studio 397, we love you, you made the best game in the history of all <laughs> video games. Um, please add it, thank you. Please add that and uh, fix fix the thing, <laughs> fix the game as well while you're at it. It's the best game of all time, <laughs> but it could work a little they're better. They're trying, they're trying their best. Yeah. I mean, they got bought by Motorsport Games, who actually, to be fair, seem to have some sort of vision for the future. Of the games they bought, so you know. Yeah. I guess it's, uh, I guess it's something. We'll, we'll see. There's still, you know, RF2, you know, only came out in 2013, so there's still you no know, time left in the cycle of the game. 
I feel. I, I still think the game has another maybe three years left in it. You know, before it gets to the point where it's like, all right, make a new game now. So, there's still time. There's still time to fix it. And uh, I, I mean, they probably are starting to think about R Factor 3 at this point. But I don't think they're developing it yet just because of the rate that they're releasing new content for this game. You know, you know, with the updated time and stuff. If they were developing a new game now, they just wouldn't care. They might release a new car or something, but they wouldn't release an updated time model. There's no point. So, yeah, I, 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 th I still think it's a few more years until a new game comes out, but they can certainly uh, put some effort into fixing it for the time being. Yeah. Well, here's a... Uh... So you're 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 uh, more optimistic than me, saying there's three years left in this. I have a sense they're going to keep this around for way longer, <laughs> just the way games are going now. Um, especially given Studio Three Nine Seven didn't make the base game. I don't know. That if, is true. Know. To be fair, um, I mean they're running. They 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 got given an absolute broken mess that ISI just kind of released as a, a half baked baby and went here you go enjoy. Um, <laughs> And to people, I have a lot of respect to Studio Three Nine Seven in that regard. What that a lot of people criticised them for the game, and you know what they've done with it. But compare that to what was released by ISI. This is a masterpiece. They have done so much to this game, and you know I can, I cannot you know appreciate enough just how just what they've done. They've just saved the game, to be honest. Because if it was released as a broken mess that didn't drive well was buggy was hard to use it didn't look nice either and you know now you know it and the graphics are banged all the way up it looks quite nice it drives a lot better it actually works sometimes i do say sometimes because it does still have moments on occasions uh i mean, i I, I actually for one quite like the new ui i know a lot of people don't and it is a bit broken i quite like it that's 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 my hot take um and that's another thing they've added as well and all the new content they're releasing as well is brilliant um you know i think they've done a fantastic job with the game um, yeah and while i i i, I would agree you know there was i i am not entirely for it. i have some critiques of what they've done some critiques of the the way they market the game nowadays and how they you know they they sell add-ons to the game almost in a kind of like an eye racing style system but as a whole i think they've done a spectacular job with it yeah that is uh i i i see i guess my central concern always with this game in terms of the marketing and the monetization is that i don't know if the game has the pickup online presence it needs to monetize itself how it does I, I think it really should just focus on selling, almost how uh, AMS2 seems to be going with the Racing USA DLC. Focus on like complete packs of content, where if you buy this one pack, you can have this entire field and like racing leagues that run this, right? Like, or even Race Room does that, right? Where they have like you can buy the WTCC pack, and it gives you all the WTCC cars and tracks. Like, I feel like that should be the focus more so, or it should make it, it should sort of position itself more in that way, just because I, I, you're really doing league racing in our factor too. Yeah. I mean, I, I've actually never played any of the AMS games. I know it's a bit shocking. Um, I just don't own them. I couldn't be bothered. Um, and when I, when I heard that AMS2 was going to be running off the P, uh, Project Cars 2 engine, I just, just ignored it from that point because I Project Cars 2 was the introduction I had to sim racing, so I have to thank you for that. It's also the worst sim I've ever played. <laughs> um, I will not, that is the one sim I will not hold back on. It drives awfully. Um, the force feedback is somehow worse than it was in Project Cars 1. Uh, the sounds aren't great, it's clunky, it's buggy, and the last time I, the, the, the online server, the public lobbies are the worst public lobbies I've ever raced in. But I did race on Xbox to be fair, so I, I am taking this with a pinch of salt. I also raced a set of course on Xbox, and I organised a set of course of races on Xbox before I had a PC, and they were perfectly fine, you know? Um, and 
to, to, to put it into context, the, the last race, the last time I played Project Cars 2 on the Xbox with my trusty Logitech G920, um, I was caught up in three separate incidents at Monza before the first corner. Not Jeez. even at the first corner, yeah. before the first corner. There was one pileup, then another pileup, and then as I got going in, someone reversed onto the racing line. And at that point, Jeez. I decided I was never playing that absolute horrendous atrocity and excuse for a game ever again and i still live by that sentence and it seems to have paid me dividends because i've now just gone off the project cars series completely i didn't play the travesty that was project cars 3 but anyway back to the point about ams <laughs> i i've never played the ams games that i always think i should because they look great they have so much low classic single seater content and i love you know like 90s and early 2000s single seater cars those are my jam I may not be overly quick in them. I'm actually I'm best off in a touring car, if I'm honest. I know it's a bit of a weird like car to be quickest in, but that's just kind of what I am in quickest in. But I like from a fun perspective, uh, like 90s and 2000s single seaters are my thing. I just love them. I love the way they sound, the way they look, the way they drive. They're just brilliant. But you know, while that's all great, I've heard stuff about the physics which aren't great. You know, I've heard you know. Uh, especially with AMS 2, you know, it's just it doesn't quite live up to the expectation. So, so if someone convinced me otherwise to get it or buy it for me if you're really nice. That was <laughs> please buy it for me. I have no money to buy games, but um, you know, it's and also it's, it's also got just a ra I mean, I guess you know, they're gonna put a load of random Brazilian content in it because it's right through their Brazilian studio, but. I'm going to be brutally honest, apart from maybe the Brazilian stock cars, I have zero interest in the random Brazilian content. So I'm not going to play like a solid like 50% of the game's like database. Yeah. That's and, uh, yeah, AMS-1. Doesn't have the physics problems, has a big modding scene. Gets you more than the Brazilian content. That's That one is... It's tough to like suggest you go back to a uh, G-Motor 1 game, but... If there was any G Motor One game worth going back to, it's the original AMS. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. yeah, like again, like I've heard so many good things about AMS One. Like I've heard the physics are so just amazing. The full feedback's really good. The cars, there's a lot of attention and care gone into them. But AMS Two, all, all I hear for some reason is negativity. Like I, I know someone who has the game, and they've said. You know, they find it enjoyable. Like, yeah, the physics aren't quite up to the same level as AMS One. Yeah, you know, it just hasn't quite picked up the same reputation. But he said, you know, just to you know, pick up and play, it's great fun. But I think because everyone came off of AMS One, which was obviously on the ISI Motor One, I think it was, which was the engine the original R Factor was built on. It might have been the ISI Motor Two. It was one of the I the first two ISI motors. Um, which, you know, is, you know, physics masterpieces. And now they're running off the Project Cars 2 engine, which wasn't a physics masterpiece, to put it politely. Um, it's obviously going to be a bit... Of, um, you know, graphically, it looks very nice. You know, it's it's a very nice-looking game. It sounds really nice. It's still got a load of all that content. I'm sure the force feedback is fine. You know, I'm sure it's it passable. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. It, it, all I hear from it is just negativity because everyone was expecting it to be, you know, the sequel to AMS 1. When in reality, while it, yeah, it does bear the Automobilista name, it was actually more like a, a reboot almost, if, if you kind of get where I'm coming from. From what I can tell, again, I've not played the game. This is just what from what I can see and what I've heard. Yeah, um, it's, it doesn't play like there's no relationship in terms of how it plays to ams1 it's not as dramatic as project cars 2 to 3 i don't think because at least rates project was, cars trying. 2 was just it was a bad excuse of a seven and project cars 3 was a bad excuse of an arcade game so you know yeah um at least rates are tried is my point um i think the biggest thing that hurts it is too many of the cars like, every car in that game drives better than a Project Cars 2 car, right? Like, if Project yeah. Cars 2 had driven, like, AMS 2, I think it would have had a much better reputation. Like, that's what it is. But the flip side is, because you're coming from AMS 1, you're attracting the people who play R-Factor 2, iRacing, Race Room, like, people who play the very serious Sims now, right? And they're, like... 
well, I have sims that drive better than this. What is the appeal? And they were like, well, it looks really pretty. It's like, it does look pretty good. The problem is ACC exists, and AC1 has those really good graphics and shaders mods. So it doesn't look... It, it doesn't look uh, any better than that. And then the physics... Especially in the classes like GT3. Like, every car... Like, GT3 is the thing every game has, right? It's a yeah. very popular category. It doesn't do that well. Now, the flip side is, it does do classic formula cars very well, actually. I, I think... There's not a lot of games with classic formula content that drives as well as AC2... I mean, sorry, as uh, AMS2. The, the flip side is, no one... Everyone wants classic formula cars... No one actually wants to race classic formula cars. Yeah, that's, that's the thing I find is everyone's like, oh yeah, I love classic formula cars. And they're like, oh cool, I want to find a classic formula league. And no one drives them because they're really hard to drive, funnily enough. Yeah. It's like, come on, make your mind up. <laughs> that is um, an interesting problem with like uh, sim racing games in general. Is like, there's a few cars everyone says they love. You know, it's Group C cars, uh, Group 5 cars classic formula cars uh some people like 90s dtm and like super touring cars but like the amount of leagues like if a dev actually puts in the game the amount of leagues that will actually form around that content the round of amount of like pickup racing around that content basically doesn't exist <laughs> um it ends up always being uh modern endurance cars and then if you're an iRacing, you're going to get NASCAR and IndyCar content. Like, that seems to be how it ends up, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, a set of Corsa Leagues is just GT3 Sprint Racing or, you know, F1 modded, you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's nothing else. Um, it is weird because, again, again like, as you said, you know, everyone is like, oh, just talks about, you know, how much they love driving groups. You know, it's because they're tricky to drive, and yeah. That, that is part of the fun, is because it, it's so hard to keep in time. It's just such a wild ride. Surely that should be part of the fun when you're racing them as well. Like, you know, trying to keep it in control. I think it's almost just because people are scared of driving them, to be honest. But, yeah, it is a shame, because, you know, I would I would do a, a classic F1 league in a heartbeat. I mean, I am dreadful in a single-seater. <laughs> Absolutely appalling. I, I did, The last league I did was a single-seater league. I was a... To, it, to be fair, it was a set of Corsa, and abusing the physics engine in a set of Corsa was hard, right? If, it, if we're talking off of like people who were driving like the cars properly as, an, as almost like, like it was real life, I was actually pretty quick. But the problem is, like compared to the people who were like abusing the physics engine, I was like a second off the pace every race, Jeez. and then I spun, and then it was just uh, ugh. This, <laughs> So, like, I, I would do a classic F1 league in a heartbeat. You know, get me in an early 2000s F1 car. They are fantastic. Get me in an early 90s F1 car. They are fantastic. They're just so, they're just, they're so just brilliant to drive, you know. You know, you, you, you know, because obviously, because I don't really race competitive anymore, because I just kind of focus on my commentary, because I've just kind of, you know, kind of realized, you know, I'm not good enough. There's no <laughs> point. I can't be bothered. I, that's, that's honestly why I keep commentating, because it's a way to stay involved. That's my excuse. Is it's a way to stay involved within the sim racing community without, you know, getting frustrated at myself every weekend. Because, you know, occasionally I'll sit back and I'll be like, yeah, I fancy doing a bit of driving. And I open it, and I will either, you know, get in just some road car and then get bored in five minutes. Or I'll step in a 90s F1 car, I'll step in a 90s F1 car. Because they are just amazing, you know, the noise they make, the way they look, the way they handle, the way they just go through every corner, like, it's nothing. It's just the most unbelievable experience. You know, and the, um, I can't even begin to imagine what it was like actually driving these things. Probably absolutely terrifying. <laughs> but, you know, in a sim, it's just the most amount of fun you can have and then no you know what i really wouldn't mind you know driving this and like putting the practice and the effort into this if i was trying to get good for a race and then you go looking for the races and they don't exist yeah. it's like i mean i get that you know people want something that's easy to practice easy to drive that everyone can get along with that's why a lot of the time leagues congregate around gt3 or you know modern formula one cars because you know that's kind of you know you want to stay modern but you know a classic formula and actually, going back to AMS2 briefly, that would be the one reason I would get AMS2 is because they have those classic F1 tracks. Not like the, you know, the 60s and the 50s F1 tracks, like the 90s variants, you know? Because to me, like, track Silverstone 
when they still use the bridge section, for example, was so good. Like, don't get me wrong, I love Silverstone. It's one of my favourite circuits. It's probably the closest circuit to me as well, give or take. It's fantastic. You know, I've been there too many times to count on my hands. It's brilliant. But, you know, when they still... The bridge section was so good. It was so good. You, know, you watch the onboards through there, and it's like, it's just ridiculously quick. And, you know, they did the, the only game that exists in is AMS2. Uh, but no, or then again, nobody runs that in a league in AMS2. So what's the point in getting it if I'm not going to drive it? It's just, yeah. this is basically an open plea to the sim racing community to start racing cars that are actually good. Yeah. Well, not good. I mean, GT3 is good, but like race cars that like I enjoy and that everyone says they enjoy, but then don't want to start a league around. Yeah. I remember when this league started, the original plan was to run GT500 cars. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, basically, I was like, so here's, and I, you know, I came to a bunch of, like, the teams that said they were interested in the league, and I said, here's what I want to run, GT500 cars, and they're like, no. <laughs> and they're like, it's, it's LMP2, or it's GT3, and I was like, well, half the tracks are too small for LMP2, so I guess it's GT3 then. <laughs> um, yeah, GT3 it is, yay! Yay. Um, and then we still ended up with uh, two GT3 cars. Four at the start. Oh, I mean, I there's only there's only two GT4 cars as well, so you know. Yeah. That's another. Yeah. See, it's unfortunate because GT4 is another class a lot of people say they like to run because you can really chuck those cars around. Mm. Um, they're they're really in, they're almost like driving touring cars, but you know, not a lot of people want to run the slower class. I I actually prefer GT4 over GT3. Mm -hmm. um, that's again. That's just a personal decision. I I just think I like I like the way they drive a bit better. It's a lot more. I mean, GT3. A lot of GT3 is about being patient, but GT4 even more. So you just got to kind of hang it around a corner and wait just for the you know the correct time. It's all about being very precise, being very patient. I also find they race a lot better as well. It's a lot more satisfying to race. You know, they're not as quick. They've not got a lot, a lot of power. So it's all like you know getting it right for the corners, duking it out through the corners. I think that's brilliant. You know. But, you know, everyone has these big dreams and wants to drive the faster cars. Um, it's only really kind of when you kind of get to a certain point in your sim racing career where you realize, actually, I'm just going to, you know, maybe going to focus on the slow cars. But then even then, you know, the top, you know, the official R-Factor content's all using, you know, GT3 stuff. So, yeah. is, you know, it's kind of this, this idea that the best drivers end up in the fastest things in terms of series. And to a degree, that's true. You know, you, you don't see a driver sticking around in Formula, like j doing a season in Formula One, but actually, I preferred an F2 car, so I'm going to go back. Mainly because also that's also against the Formula Two regulations. You're not allowed <laughs> to do that. But, you know, also because everyone who's an F2 wants to go to F1. But it's it's I, I, it's I don't know. It's just a it's a bit of a weird situation because you know, in in kind of motorsport and sim racing, is just there's almost kind of this elitism around the idea that the, the, the quicker cars require the more skill to drive and while yes that that is true to a degree i'm not saying you know driving an f1 car is a piece of cake but there's there's also a certain skill required around kind of the mid speed cars you know gt4 for example or you know like second tier in you know a lot of motorsports there is a very you know precise and delicate kind of driving style you need for that and you know they, they are similar to touring cars in a way that you can kind of just throw them about a bit and it's you know, you can maybe do a bit of wheel rub and it won't hurt you that much. But, you know, they are, you know, GT4 cars are akin to GT3 cars. They are you know, custom built machines for racing or touring cars. They are also custom built machines for racing, but in a different kind of way. Um, and, you know, GT4 is just, it's, it's just, it's just a, di you know, a different kind of style. I just, I really like it. I, I'm a, it disappoints me how, you know, how little attention it gets because I think it's brilliant. But, yeah, it's, um, no, that's just a personal opinion again. I mean, obviously, of course, my personal opinions are correct because everyone else's opinion is below <laughs> mine. But, yeah, that's just my, that's my, that's my hot take. Hot take for the hot take for the day. I think it's largely correct though. I, I I my only sim race, the only like league like proper league event race I've won was in a GT4 car, um, an ACC. It was a Camaro at Spa. That was fun. And then, you know what I did? I proceeded to never sign up for another GT4 race again, even though that's what I wanted. Because I'm 
like every other sim racer, I want to be in the fastest class. I want to win in the fastest class. Um, the other half of the problem is quite often leagues will sign, have a, you know, we're going to do a nine hours of spa, multi-class, GT3 v GT4, you know, whole deal. And then, you know, you sign up for GT4, and then you look at a week before the race, and you are one of the two teams that signed up for GT4. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it, it is frustrating because, you know, especially, you know, when you are one of the two teams that sign up for GT4, I mean, is that no one no one wants to be in this little class. Everyone wants to drive the faster cars because, you know, they're cooler, they're harder driving. You think, oh, look at me, I've got aspirations of being a big real-life racing driver driving a very fast car, and that's cool and all, but driving any racing car is a privilege. And, you know, it's the same thing in Sim as well. You know, it's... I don't think people realise just how... how lucky we are as Sim racers. We are arguably the most lucky, you know, kind of, like, fans out there in terms of how realistic, you know, what we obsess over it is. Yeah. Because, you know, maybe Flight Sim is the only thing I would say which is closer in terms of simulators because and also you don't really get any other simulators like, you know someone you can be a competitive FIFA player that's all well and good but that's not going to make you an any better football player is it but you know here this is this is a set the only thing different between sim racing on paper may I add because obviously there's a lot of differences really but the only thing different from being a sim racer you know a real world racer is you don't get any feeling through your bum yeah. because you know you, you don't have the seat movement and you, maybe you don't feel a bit of g-force as well that's about it you know you feel it all through the wheel it's all the same all the physics are supposedly the same we are incredibly incredibly lucky i know we have the ability to do something which a lot of racing drivers don't know you know we can jump behind any car we want you know you want to you know jump in a 2020 f1 car and you know run around the, the streets of like Los Angeles or something, you can do that. If you want to get an, a 60s F3 car and do like a, a race around some modern autodrome, you can do that. If you want to race around a classic track that hasn't been used in years in a modern kind of thing, you can do You can, you know, get an F1 car at a go kart track if you really wanted to. You can. We are so lucky. It's not only do we have the, the ability to basically live out our dreams from our bedrooms, but it's the fact that we can do so much more. And, you know, I think a lot of people take that for granted. Um, and, you know, yeah, everyone wants to be a racer. You go to a racetrack, it's the same thing. Everybody there, the fans, the mechanics, yeah, even the competitors, they all want to be a race car driver. Everyone does. And, you know, most of us aren't that lucky. We either don't have the talent, we don't have the budget, we only kind of just got into it too late to start, because nowadays you basically have to be six and in a go-kart, you're never going to make it. It's... um. And sim racing kind of gives you an outlet to, you know, live out your dreams from your own bedroom. And it's, I think we just take it for granted a little bit, to be honest. There is definitely some truth in that, but I, I guess that is people in general. <laughs> <laughs> That's always true. looking at yeah. the bet. You can always find the problem in the. Uh, you can always fly the find the fly in the ointment, so to speak. But uh, even to think that, like, if you go back uh, twenty years ago, you know. Certainly, they had some sim racing 20 years ago in 2001, uh, but it would, it, it's nothing compared to what we have now. And then if you go back another 20 years from that, you go 40 years back, like, there's nothing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's, uh, that's still, re that's like around, like, revs, like, the first sim, and you compare revs to this, it's, uh, shocking. Oh, I mean, the progress we've made in, you know, 20 years is astounding. Yeah, it really is, and and then I guess it was it was it was a weird situation last year, and that COVID helped out sim racing. I mean, a lot of people weren't a, lot, a big fan of all the new people flocking in because you know it was just you know one of those parts. You know, video gaming as a whole, the whole industry had a massive boom in 2020 because suddenly everyone's sitting around inside for you know half a year. Um, it's. So, and Sim Racer was one of those ones that really profited, and then for some reason it's just continued to grow afterwards, uh, <laughs> which no one can wrap their head around, because I think everybody I know was sitting there waiting for the bubble just to burst, and just everyone stopped coming, and the whole thing just collapsed. It was going to be really funny, and we could all point and laugh at how silly everybody was. But it's just carried on growing. Um, and, yeah, you know, it's come a long way, and it will go a long way into the future. 
but it, you know especially you know with the amount of people that are flocking in now you know it's as good as um, um, most people you know will probably flock to something like i racing because you know new people you know uh, most people you know, I, I find for example in the assetto course or an r factor 2 kind of spectrum don't actually touch i racing because they don't enjoy it but um most you know new people if they didn't know anything about sim racing you know they're going to go oh yeah top 10 you know sim leagues oh, that's an alpine going very wide out of the last corner there huh. um just a, a divert attention there is actually a race going on if you didn't notice um you know, if you Google, you know, like, don't, you know, simulators to buy, the first thing that come up is, you know, iRacing, most online simulator, best online racing. And they're going to think, great, that's me. And they're going to sign up to that. So I don't think we really quite felt the full effects of it over here in the RF2 community. But um, it's still, you know, just you know, with, with the amount of people that have flocked in, you know, the amount of money that's now being sunk into this, the, how popular it's got. It's only just going to keep getting better and better, quicker and quicker. Um, and all it is, it is a bit perverse that you know something that has killed so many people has allowed such a thing to flourish. <laughs> but you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's it's just how it is, and you know, in, in some ways I'm th I'm thankful for it. In other ways, you know, I don't I'm not thankful for it. But the, the COVID nineteen pandemic, it's um, yeah, it certainly helped us out a little bit. It's got some silver linings to a very dark cloud. Um... I'm a history major, and it took so much strength to not start start making comparisons to historical pandemics when you said that. I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be better. <laughs> Focused on the sim racing. So I could very quickly end up on a rant about history. Um, anyways, just a few side notes worthy of uh, mentioning, since you did say there is a race going on. So Whitlock has now put that gap up far enough that even with the penalty... Uh, on the next round of pit stops, they should stay in the lead, barring... Well, there's not a lot to bar, because I can't imagine there's any damage on any of these cars at this point. Um, I, at this track, you either don't get damaged or you're out, because you have to have a very dramatic moment to uh, damage the car. Um, aside from that, uh, Pascal Eggert is continuing to dominate that GT4 uh, duel. So that's the best way to describe it. It's not so much a battle as it is a duel. Um, yeah, that Bentley. I, I I actually commentated an ACC race yesterday, and Bentley's got the top three positions. Uh, it seems to be a very powerful car in sim racing, the uh, Continental. Uh, I still remember when that car first came out. It was back when... Um, the SCCA's GT3 series was around, back when that still had a... was starting to get some energy behind it. It, it, it petered out, unfortunately, after only... It, it got its legs for about three seasons and then died off, but that's where they actually unveiled the original 2020... Sorry, the original uh, Continental GT3 car was the 2015 one. It was in an SCCA, of all things. Um... Back when the Cadillacs were had a GT3 car and all that, and they were racing there. Um, that was an interesting series. I don't even remember what it's called. Was the Pirelli World Challenge, I think it was called? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. It was interesting because it didn't follow the SRO's GT3 rules, so you could have manufacturer one-off GT3 cars made specifically for it. So you had some interesting GT3 cars you could see nowhere else, because it was literally the GT3 car was made specifically for that series. And it would race against regular GT3 cars. Um, yeah. Unfortunate that series didn't uh, make it. Sometimes that's how it works, though. Sometimes some uh, series just don't don't yeah. work. I mean, I can... I can... Um, I mean, I could if I wanted to destroy any leagues that I felt now, I mean, like, real-life series, and then destroy potentially my future as a commentator if I am a fancy <laughs> professional. But, um, I can certainly pinpoint you a few leagues which and series which I know for a fact just I'm not going to survive that far into the future. So, I'll just, I'll, one of them starts with W and ends with series, that's all I'll say. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, sometimes it's just not meant to be. Um, you know, it's, it's it's all well and good, you know, succeeding in motorsport and sim racing as a driver. 
and as a team, but actually a lot of people don't realise, you know, actually as, as a series, how hard it is to keep going. Because, you know, as a series, your main job... Ooh, that was actually a touch of the wall there, yeah. I think, for the 818 car. But um, as a series, you know, as, as a driver and a team, your, your main role is to win races and win championships and bring home glory and drink a lot of champagne and be merry and go down in the history books. But as a series, your primary goal is to make money. Um, obviously, motorsport, sim racing, nowhere near as much. Money is is starting to creep into sim racing uh, in, on the actual like league settings. Obviously, it's still around because you need to buy wheels and stuff. But in terms of actual, you know, you know, getting paid for driving, you know, leagues offering prize money, it's only kind of just really starting to creep in and become a bit serious. Uh, obviously, in real life, though, it's a different story. You know, it's series. It's all about earning money. It's all about you know making sure you can carry on and getting the bank check done um it's hard to do that it is especially as a startup nowadays uh you know you can think of the amount of leagues that just have kind of folded over you know a1 gp i think is a primary example it was a great idea very popular but it just they didn't have the budget to carry on you know there wasn't enough big names in it that there wasn't you know, enough big... I mean, the teams were national teams run by different people, so there was no basically budget on that. There was no m real sponsorship money. So it was a great idea. It was very popular, but in the end, it just wasn't meant to be. And, you know, sometimes that's how it is. And in sim racing, because a lot of the stuff we do is for free, you know, that isn't so much of an issue. But in the future, you know, money is going to start to come in. And free leagues will always be a thing, because there will always be people out there who just fancy a free little dry run. That would be great. But it, and leagues do just come and go naturally, you know. Sometimes, you know, people just give up, they can't be bothered. Sometimes the, the attendance, the interest isn't there for that league. But, you know, when money seriously starts to come into sim racing, which, you know, will be a couple years tops, I think, um, it's going to be a big shake up in the league market because there's, there's a few leagues as it is now out there which have, you know, a really bit of staple, even, even you know, in our. Oh, off actually they've really been a staple of the community and you know they're starting to fade um again i won't name drop any leagues but uh they're, they're really starting to go backwards a bit in terms of viewership interest driver quality team quality you know stewardship quality um so we could be i think at a few times when the money comes in and it does come in properly uh we could be seeing a big shake up in the whole league system of sim racing it'll be interesting to see i'm i'm cautiously optimistic about it i think is the correct thing to say because you know i'm excited for what the future holds but at the same time it might be a change for the worse yeah that is sort of the uh fear there it, it, you know what is an interesting sort of uh example of what you're talking about in that sense is sort of been the situation with uh, games like siege uh that game sort of started out relatively small had a big boom about two years after the game came out. Had a big, ended up having a massive flourishing esports scene, and then just in the last year, as the esports scene has just like the the bubble has burst, the game has uh, in turn started to uh, have a bit of a fall from grace. Now I don't think that will kill the game the same way I think the esports bubble potentially bursting in sim racing won't kill sim racing by any stretch of the imagination but you can kind of see how uh investors can begin to think yes this is gonna be the big new thing this is what the millennials are watching stick and ball sports are dead <laughs> esports is the future and then they see there's five thousand people tops watching an esports race and they're like oh okay never mind <laughs> um yeah i mean even even you know in the uh on the professional spectrum of social because there are people out here who do esports professionally you know it's tough because the you know even with the boom of esports and how big it's gone they're just actually watching it there just isn't a big enough audience for it you know the, the official r factor 2 leagues the biggest you know, I, the audience i've seen is probably 300 people watching at one time because just <laughs> Not to sound crude, but nobody really cares. Everyone wants to be driving and not watching. Um, and even the majority, the, the reason endurance leagues do so well in sim racing, um, you know, when you compare especially to you know, real life and just how other leagues operate, the reason they do so well 
It's because most of the people watching are teammates. Yeah. You know, there's people who have got out of the car or haven't gotten into the car yet. They think, hey, I'll watch the race. Yeah. So, and it's very, it's a, it's a bit of a weird, unique situation. But, um, yeah, and that, that's why it does so well, I find. Because, uh, you know, if you compare the, the views on an endurance league to any, you know, sprint league, the endurance thing I can guarantee you will be higher because partially because sim racing endurance is just really big in sim racing for some reason, but also because teammates watch. Because if you just go, hey, if, if you just walked up to a random person on the street, but like, hey, new sim race on right now, they've got some like random car around some random track, 50 laps, you win. <laughs> I can guarantee you they will either call you a rude word or tell you to go away and never speak to them again and then get a restraining order on you it's <laughs> um it's it, it's a weird situation because just it's like, again you know in other esports you know you know like league of legends or something for example i mean i don't play league of legends but you can just tell like, that the, the entire fan base that watches it just watches it because they're not playing themselves yeah actual casual esports fans don't exist mainly because they just start playing the game themselves anyway and then they get involved because you can do that you know i can't just hop into an f1 car and just go around and become an f1 driver <laughs> but i can certainly join a league and you know start driving around there instead um it's a similar thing with esports you know casual esports fans just do not exist yeah. um so you know and, and again harking back to what i said just a few minutes ago yeah, the whole kind of budget thing with esports is interesting and in how, you know, money's going to start to come into it. But then again, at the same time, nobody really watches it. So who really knows what's going to happen? Because all the people that watch it are people that play the games. So it's, it's a very weird situation. So as you're saying that, just a quick update on the race that's worth some note is Ryan Whitlock has had some very scuffed laps the last he goes around about a second off the pace. I'm wondering if the tires are slowly starting to go on that Bentley. Um, as we are getting quite close to the hour mark, people are running softs. Uh, the fuel conditions, we should be seeing pit stops in the next 10 minutes or so. So it'll be interesting to see if Meyer is a little bit better late into the stint or if uh, Ryan just made a few mistakes and you'll be back up the pace. Um, but yeah. Very, uh, it'll be interesting to see where esports is in the next uh, little bit. I, I feel like, uh, as you said, nobody casually watches it. It tends to be the player base watches the esports. And I, I, yeah. I, I and, oh, as I say that, Daniel Meyer is in the pits actually, getting a fresh set of boots. We'll see if somebody else hops into that car if he plans to carry on. If they're splitting the race in half, he will be hopping out. Um,. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think a big problem with a big reason sim racing has uh, endurance being popular is I'd be not surprised if at least 45% of the people doing endurance racing watched Jimmy Broadbent's VEC streams <laughs> and like, I want to do that. Um, and, and it kind of cuts to why I think it's not popular um, in terms of viewing outside of perhaps that context where you're watching a personality you're fond of. Because I heard somebody hit something in the back. One of the GT4s, I think Vrak went off at some point. Um, yeah, I, I think part of the problem is that you learn something. If you're a player of uh, League of Legends, right, you will learn something from watching a top-level esports player or esports team play League of Legends, right? You'll learn a strategy. You'll learn a build. I don't look, play League of Legends, but I imagine that's the context. <laughs> um, from my cursory knowledge of it. If you watch iRacing or R Factor, you actually don't learn a lot. Besides a cursory knowledge of the track, like, you know, where are the, uh, what's the layout? Because the teams are kind of hiding the setup from you. Um, a lot of stuff that's important for, like, you're just not going to learn a lot other than by doing laps on your own and racing. Like, that's how you learn how to do R-Factor. And so you gotta go out and do R-Factor. But if you want to play CSGO, 
you actually learn something from watching CSGO if you're a CSGO player. Now that means if I don't play CSGO, I'm not going to watch pro CSGO. Same way if I... But nonetheless, there's a there's a value in watching it. I don't think East, that uh, sim racing esports quite provides. And I'm not sure there is a way to provide it. So yellow in Sector 2. Gabor Hootsty oh, no. is around. He's got that car going again. A little bit of a mistake there for Gabor. Yeah. He doesn't look like much damage. I think he just spun in the middle of the track. Yeah. Uh, That's how it goes. That is. Um, as you were saying, though, I mean, love him or hate him, you, you cannot deny that Jimmy is, you know, Jimmy Broadbent is just such... A major player in how sim racing operates nowadays. I mean, he's without a doubt the biggest sim racing influencer there is. I mean, he's massive. He and he's partially responsible for why he's so successful as it is today. And I agree to a degree. You know, uh, you know, people watching his endurance races back on VEC back in the day is probably why it's so big. Endurance racing, and you know, since he's gone, you know, VEC has just it's been tumbling, frankly, in popularity. It's, it's a bit weird. Um, yeah, I mean, he's just... It's, 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 it's weird to have, you know, watch one guy have so much control over what goes. Because, again, you know, that's... Um, you know, we were talking about AMS 2 earlier. When, he was one of the guys that, when he first played it, said that he was disappointed with it. And the game just disappeared. Yep. You know, he said one. He he did like five videos on it total. Said yeah, it looks amazing, drives very nicely, but it it isn't, in my opinion, quite as good as the first game. And everyone, oh, not playing it then. Because yeah. it's. I mean, that's just the way kind of modern society and influences is is kind of it's kind of weird how we've ended up with that anyway. But he's kind of the the main guy. Yeah. You know, nobody even comes close to him. In terms of their influence or their popularity, or you know, and I can see why he's popular. To be fair, he's you know he's a, he's a very easygoing guy. He's relatively competitive. He's not quick enough that he's an alien, but you know he's he, he's good enough that he will occasionally win a race, and you know you can you know get behind him for that. Um, and so it's it's not hard to see why he's popular. He's obviously tapped into a, a, a very, you know, he, what was when he started at the time was quite a niche market. It's kind of made it his own. Um, but it's, yeah, he's just, he's without a doubt just a, a driving force in the way the sim racing goes. Um, and it's, 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 as I said, yeah, he, he is partially the reason of why it's so popular there. Because, you know, you search up sim racing on YouTube, for example, the first thing that comes up is a Driver 61 video on how realistic is sim racing. Which is... <laughs> which is actually, to me, for Driver 61 does some good content, I'll give them yeah. that. I do I do like their stuff occasionally. Yeah. And then I uh, I think the second thing that comes up is Ginny, I think. Let me just double check. I'll just punch into YouTube now, sim racing. It's that Driver 61, and yep, then it's a Jimmy Broadbent video. There you go. So... You know that just that just puts it into perspective. You, you don't even search up Jimmy Brawl when you don't search up one of his name tags. You you just search up sim racing, and he comes up. Yep. You know that's that's how big this guy is. And I mean, it's it's, it's just weird because I, I still can't remember. I mean, I'm personally not a fan of him anymore. I just you know that's just a personal decision. I didn't like the direction that his content went in. Um. And, you know, I've, you know, one of my close friend groups was, uh, you know, one of them was a mod with him for a long time and then just kind of stepped down from that. And, you know, because we all just kind of had our individual criticisms of him and we all just kind of went our own way away from him and just kind of stayed as a friend group. Yeah. But it's then again, like, you know, it's not that hard to see why it's so popular. Um, when I started watching when he had about 5,000 subscribers on YouTube, I think, and I, you know, at the time he, he was very funny. And obviously when... It's the same thing with all YouTubers and you know streamers and stuff like that. You know, when your audience grows, you need to change your style in a way which you know is most appealing to a lot of people. And a lot of the time, that puts off a lot of the old fans. Yeah. Then again, also you also because Jimmy is the forefront of sim racing, he now also has you know the brand's interest as well. So that's as well as well. I think why he, why he another thing that's so weird is because you, you don't find, I 
think a lot of like other you know like gaming you know kind of genres for example like you don't, you don't find like professional FIFA player. I know I keep saying FIFA like professional like EA sports players or something just getting sent free stuff to review. Okay. Obviously, Time to be have... a race steward for a bit. Oh, so. Karen being the race steward. Be the race steward. <laughs> and I'll come back and do my thing. Yeah. So remember, we got to serve that 10 second penalty there, Ryan. So once the car is off the jacks, we'll hold you for 10 seconds and then we'll let you go. Release you into the wind. Like a, like a flower petal or something. Okay, I'm going to stop doing poetry here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. Gabor going through there. Going to get his lap back now. That'll even everything out. Why does it say Schooneman is nine laps... Oh, wait, nine laps behind. That's fair. Never no, I was going to say nine laps behind Soul. That's shocking. Casey Soul in the car, by the way, for the GRG. So we've had uh, driver swaps on both the GT4s. Um, we'll see if Ryan stays in or if they're planning to swap every hour. Okay, so let's hold for ten seconds here. Okay, you're good to go. And stewarding is done. <laughs> and stewarding is done. Um, yeah, there we go. See where he comes out. Yeah. It's it's funny because I remember when I started watching Jimmy Broadbent, Empty Box was bigger than him. Empty Box's yeah, opinion Empty mattered Box, that's more. That's an old name, man. <laughs> that is an old name. Yeah. Like, the people like like what the the first kind of big group of sim racing streamers was kind of Empty Box and Matt Malone. Those were the two names that were really kind of big. Um, yeah. Jimmy's just kind of just soared into the, the stars now because it's just how kind of persistent he is in his upload schedule. Like Empty Box hasn't just uploads when he feels like it. Now Malone just kind of comes and goes as he pleases as well. Yeah. So I know I know he's got a family to look after now. Um, yeah, man, empty box. Wow, I remember watching his indie car videos back in the day. We're like, this is so cool. Yeah, I want to do this. So I still I, haven't got I racing. <laughs> I legitimately only started caring about sim racing. See, Jimmy Broadbent's why I care about endurance racing. But the reason I care about sim racing full stop is empty box. Yeah, uh, his original indie car videos. That's why I watched the 2013 Indy 500. Which was the first race I'd watched after Dale Earnhardt's death. That's how long it had been. Wow. Um, and then I just loved it. Uh, it was a really exciting race because a rookie, Carlos Munoz, was fighting for the win in that race. And it was just like such a dramatic story to follow. Of course, it being IndyCar, they like, the Indy 500 especially, they overdo that so much. But, you know, me being, like, what, uh, 15, I fell for it. And, uh... <laughs> got into sim racing. Begged my parents for a G27. They got me a, uh, not a G27. Uh, <laughs> they got me something significantly worse. Oh, I mean, so, not, not, not that the G27 is bad, of course. Yeah. No, they got me one of those wheels that's, like, got, like, the elastic sort of resistance in it. Oh, wow. Um, that is the lowest of the low, isn't it? Yeah, and I was like, uh, this isn't usable, um, so then I got a G27. Uh, played R Factor for years after that. Never, I don't think I, but I actually didn't do a league race until COVID. Hmm. Um, yeah, so here we are. Moral of the story, these, these personalities on YouTube really do matter, though. I guess is all we're getting Yeah, they at. do. I mean, you know... Kind of the whole kind of gaming scene on YouTube is, is past its peak, you know, it kind of hit its peak like 2015-ish. But, you know, sim racing is such a niche kind of thing, and they do matter, because obviously, as I said, as I was going to say earlier before you had to go do stewarding, you know, partly, you know, what Jimmy has is because he's so big, he's basically the biggest marketing tool there is in sim racing. You know, there is no point, you know, paying for, you know, in my opinion, anyway, you know, companies might think differently, but, you know, when you, you don't pay to... No sponsor an event or something. There's no point because why did you can pay to sponsor Jimmy Broadbent video and that is going to get viewed by at least twenty times as many people. Yeah, because he is just so, and that's why he gets sent so much stuff for free. That's why he 
you know, get so much of this sponsorship because he is massive. You know, he he got like what seven hundred and fifty thousand subscribers on YouTube, which is probably bigger than the amount of people who even looked at the R Factor Two Steam page. Yeah, it, it, it is ridiculous. True. I think the only person who I can think of who's Boosted Media has done well recently, since the pandemic. They've gotten a bit of a base. Chris Hayes, okay. And I think Sim Racing Garage, maybe? If you oh, care for Sim hardware. Barry Rowland over at Sim Racing. <laughs> if I ever need to fall asleep to someone, I'll back him His voice is like warm milk. My word. I love that man so much. Um, like... I, th I think, yeah, like, Barry Rowland, I love him. I think he's kind of the hardcore sim racers YouTuber, yeah. if you know what I mean. Because he's not about, you know, like, driving around and doing this and that and the other. He's not, he just does gear reviews, plain and simple, goes really in-depth. But, you know, it's it, you can waste an hour and a half watching him talk about a set of pedals, for God's sake. <laughs> it is brilliant. Uh, he is definitely, you know, the hardcore sim racers YouTuber, in my opinion. Um, I love him. He's fantastic. Because, you know, he doesn't even drive for YouTube. He just sits there, he talks about it, he takes stuff apart. He only drives right at the end of the video. And even then, you know, he's not talking about how competitive he is. He just talks about how he feels. Yeah. And he's obviously been, you know, he's obviously been around the sim racing block for a long old time. Um, and yeah, he's just... And again, again, Chris Hay as well. Chris Hay is a very, uh, very, very talented video producer. Um, you know, he's, he... I'm not. I'm trying to think of the time. Obviously, you know, Barry Rowland is kind of the sim racing garage is like the sim racers YouTuber. Chris Hay is kind of the sim racing photographers YouTuber. His videos are so gorgeous to watch. I also have a bit of admiration for him as a musician as well because he, he does all his own music, which I, I respect. Cause that takes that. a lot of time to do, uh, and he makes very nice videos. And again, a lot of the time he's not. He either talks about cars or wheels or. And uh, a boosted media again. That's a there. There's some guys that I think are, do a really good job actually, and I think part of that is how how honest they are. Um, that you know that when you watch their stuff, you know this is you know as you know flat as it gets. There's not there's nothing behind this. They actually did a video really recently. Actually, really interesting. It was basically half an hour of them talking about how they earn money. Yeah. And it was really interesting. You know, saying you know. This is how the sponsorship works with us. You know, this is what we do with this. This is what we do. Like, if they send us free stuff, and you know, this is what we do with it. And it was really interesting. I don't think I've seen actually anyone ever full stop be that open about how they operate a content creation business before. Yeah, it was really quite interesting. Um, and I, you know, I, I like just going to casually watch. I don't really casually watch them that much compared to the other two. But it was just so fascinating because it was. You know, it's just one that you don't. It's kind of almost a bit of a thing, you know. Just in general, you don't really ask. Well, where I'm from, in the UK, it's kind of a bit. It's considered quite rude to ask people how much money they earn. Yeah. It's it's just a bit of a thing. I'm not sure why it is, but it just is. You know, it's you can ask what job you are. You know, whether you like it. You know, are you good at your job? But asking someone's salary is just considered a bit unpolite. So, and again, on YouTube, it's just a bit of a thing. It's just a bit, you know, people say, oh, yeah, I earn this much. You can say, you know, I earn this much per video. If I, like, there was a, this this guitar, this musician I watched called Music Is Win. I don't know if anyone's heard of him. But um, he he spent $5,000 on a guitar pedal. Wow. And, you know, I said, you know, if this video gets a million views, you know, that will pay for that. So, you know, better hope it gets a million views. I think it did in the end. But, um, mm. you know. No one really talks about how much money they're on YouTube. And for these guys just to come out and go, listen, this is what we earn from YouTube. This is what we earn from a sponsorship. These will be the people we talk to. These are conditions we set for sponsorship. You know, these are the contracts. Sometimes it falls through because of it was fascinating. Because I've never seen someone so openly honest about that. I think it was such a breath of fresh air. Because, you know, sim racing, you know, being a sim racing influencer on YouTube is so different to your casual sim because your casual sim racer will have you know a wheel in the region of about you know maybe 500 euros 500 dollars something like that not you know not cheap but not expensive they might have you know like a you know a basic rig they'll probably be running off a single screen setup uh you know these guys are out here running the highest gear vr triple screen setups and all that you know, they are living the high life as far as you know, sim racing gear goes. And, you know, there's plenty of people out there I know who, you know, no offense to these sim racing people, have far more talent in, in at the wheel of a car. But, you know, 
just kind of sit around on a tiny little dinky screen and you know a, a thrust master they've got attached to their desk so it's um yeah to see them come out and be like you know this is what we do with all this it was honestly i think is one of my favorite sim racing videos that i've ever seen because it was just so painfully honest about it it was actually you know i, I genuinely had to take my hat off and applaud them because it was fantastic mm. yeah there's very much like a uh I don't, it's almost like there's it's funny because he has such a crazy high-end rig, right? But he somehow manages to be incredibly relatable. Like, I don't know yeah. what it is. There's something about the guy. He does he does a good job at seeming like I'm just... Uh, I'm very... Fo he, he seems to appreciate what he's, what he's able to do. I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, just a quick note of the oh yeah there's a race still going on in the middle of this <laughs> podcast um <laughs> casey soul has taken a 10 second chunk out of schuneman since the pit stops she's running about two to three seconds a lap faster than that fine avant car so uh we could have something heat up in gt4 at this pace uh it's uh it'll be an interesting comeback story if she can pull that off in that alpine um, yeah, it's, it, this is a track where, because it's so big, uh, there, there's a lot of, like, high commitment corners where you can make up a lot of time if you get it right, and right now, let's just see how much faster she was last go around. She was five seconds faster on the last lap. What is go going on? Pure pace is what's going on. <laughs> Absolute ludicrous pace. That Alpine is flying <laughs> along. Oh, Five geez, seconds geez. is a lot of time to gain at any track, especially here. Wow, that's some lap time. It's a 1 minute 20 second lap. This isn't the Nürburgring, man. That's impressive. Yeah, that is, that is ridiculously quick. And the GT4 as well. Wow. Yeah. On the flip side, uh, Gabor Hutsti, that spin on his outlap kind of uh, threw away any time they would have gained from that uh, penalty to the uh, Madhouse car or the... Uh, Charger Racing, I suppose, is the uh, name Madhouse has taken in this league. Um, yeah, has sort of uh, lost the advantage they would have gained from that penalty, so they're now behind the eight ball, trying to get back up. Uh, but right now, Ryan seems to have settled in, setting some consistent laps. Managed to get a 112-421 in there at some point, although he's mostly running 113s. Um, so yeah, it'll be a uh, tough battle for Gabor to uh, get back. In the next hour and a bit, we have to go. Yeah, we're past the halfway mark. Just time is just flying by here. Um, on that note, why don't we take a quick water break? And we'll be back in about a minute or two. Just uh, get ourselves a second to recharge those batteries, get a snack, get a drink, and we'll be right back. I'm still here, so I'll just talk about the race while oh, it's going Oh, sure. On. Yeah, go ahead then. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about the race. So we can see here just the uh, the Alpine flying through some corners. It's uh, number 36, which is currently in the lead of the GT forecast out of the two. And it's still going around. The uh, the 444 is not the 36. The number's got the number 36 in it. It's the 444 Fine Avon Motorsport car of Peter Schoenemann. The uh, Dutch team doing a very good job out there today. And obviously, as Christian was saying, Casey Salt chasing him down in the uh, GRG Esports number 36. That's what's got the 36 there. That's the wrong skin, maybe. I don't know. It, it, it's a number. As they are now head out of turns one and two down onto the runway. There are a few, uh, there are a few racing tracks which are at airports, but not many which are actually airports. The only one that comes to mind that is an airport or what is a... Uh, actually, no, Silverstone technically still is an airport. Um, it's still... Uh, I think it is still technically classified as an airport. Even though there's no runways there now. I think there's a helicopter landing pad there, so they, they count it. Because the two main runways are now the two main straights there. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's actually a weird statistic that on the uh, race day of the British Grand Prix, Silverstone becomes the most populated airport in the world. So there you are. The only other track that I can think of as a, uh, and that's very wide from the uh, Alpine. The only other track that I can think of that comes to mind that is an airport is Sebring. And they don't really use that one either anymore. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit weird to have a track that just is an airport. Um, I'm sure 
the uh, folks flying in and out of Cleveland for work or whatever. We're really appreciating uh, Champ Car coming down for the weekend uh, when this was an actual event back in 2007 and before that. But uh, as we can see there, there's the uh, 515 going down the inside line. Or the 818, apologies. It's got the wrong number on it. Uh, back to the Alpine now. Four cars remaining here at Cleveland. Out of the seven cars that we had signed up, we've uh, just got a... Uh, under halfway to go, I believe, unless my uh, timing is all over the shot, which is also a possibility because uh, I know none of you will have heard my commentary before, but uh, get used to it. I can't do maths, so that's uh, all I'll say on that front. In my, uh, to put it into context, uh, when I did my massive maths exam for school, uh, I had the worst score in the year. I still passed, but it was the worst score in the year, and uh, I wasn't even in bottom set. I was in middle set, so uh, you know. But enough about my failures. Let's focus back to the race, shall we? Um, as the Alpine carries around through the chicane and onto the widest main straight this side of the Mississippi. And then braking once again. It is a very stop starty circuit. This is kind of break 90 degree corner, break 90 degree corner. But, you know, that's that's sometimes a positive thing to happen on a racetrack. It's all about precision, all about being technical. And uh, as we head through, we get the uh, other out. That is that the other Alpine there already? It is as well. Casey Sol is only a second and a half behind now. My goodness me, that is some pace. She is... Wow, she is flying, isn't she? Wow, she is going. Um, so there's going to be an overtake here in a minute. Get ready for that. <laughs> and uh, you could just see through the first turn. You can just see how much time Casey Sol is gaining under the brakes. And I mean, this is fine, Avon Motorsport. This is a team that is pretty well established. And Katie Sol is about to absolutely send them into the void. Can't quite hang around the outside into the right-hander. Tries the switch back into the left-hander. Oh, that is a wonderful move. And that is P1 in class for Casey Sol. That was brilliant. Just a little switch back onto the inside. Fantastic move up into P3. She has been coming for a long old time now. Oof, and uh, she finally gets into that lead of the GT4 sport. Welcome back, Christian. You've just missed a fantastic move by Casey Solomon. <laughs> lead. Good thing I left oh. it on the GT4 cars and not the GT3 cars then. Well, you did the right move there. You just <laughs> a brilliant overtake. Yeah, let's see if Schooneman can follow and maybe learn the track because that just seems what it's like it just seems like Sudeman doesn't know the layout that is a possibility to be fair um, so yeah this is certainly a track I think uh, this is an actually an interesting part of this right is Whitlock and Seoul are both Americans we're probably familiar with this circuit and I bet these Europe mostly European drivers and Hootsie and Sudeman right now they're like what the heck is this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, fine, I was just saying, fine, I'm a motorsports. I mean, they're a Dutch team, so they're used mm -hmm. to kind of, like, flat things. And although the airport is flat, it's also um, very wide, very straight, which is uh, akin to that of North America. So uh, I'm sure they're very confused about the whole experience. There's no real reference points around here either no. because it's an airport. So it's very hard to kind of judge where you're going. Um, yeah. So that might be playing around a bit as well in the minds of these drivers. Yeah, this is, you, you certainly need, especially if you, like, I'm not even sure if in being in VR might help you, perhaps. I'm sure none of these people are running VR, but you really have nothing to go by except the brake markers, like the uh, signboards. Uh, other than that, you've just got to kind of uh, memorize it. So you, the practice really matters here. Yeah, it certainly does. Um... I mean, reference points at a lot of tracks, you know, it's right, like, you know, a lot of European circuits, for example, uh, as the music car laps the fine other motorsport car there. A lot of European circuits are very narrow, very kind of, I mean, yeah, there are some circuits straight, but very narrow, often walls not far away from the circuit. Um, so there's a lot of reference points. There's often trees lining all around the outside of the track, so there's, there's, it's easy to pick a reference point. This is a field with some runway on it <laughs> so you know it's uh it's a bit trickier yeah but you know i'm sure you know that's that's what separates the best from the bet uh from the rest because uh you know 
being an expert at a track like this where there are no reference points kind of just proves you're better. Yeah, that is for sure. Man, already a 10 second gap Sol has built on Shuneman. That is dramatic. Um, it's like they're running in different classes. Yeah, she's flying at the moment. Yeah, the... Uh, it, it reminds me when I was... You, you see this kind of when I was watching like the ACC race the other day as well, is quite often there's a... Uh, it really shows <laughs> very quickly when you're unfamiliar with a circuit and you're thrown out into a race because you feel like, oh, I'll figure it out. But even in that ACC race, we saw someone who was nine seconds off the pace, right? And they're getting all mm. sorts of trouble out there. So the team quickly got them, got them out of the car, right? And they put the first driver back in. Hour later, that driver comes back and magically he's on pace. I have a, <laughs> So you're like, oh, so you must have gotten a single player and done some laps <laughs> and figured it out. Yeah, um, I assume so. Yeah, either that or they've just, you know, stopped taking whatever drugs they were consuming and, like, actually focused on the event. Yeah, they, were, they said those shrooms ain't shit, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had to let them wear off after. Um, please, YouTube, don't come at us. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, that is weird. That's, I mean, I've seen, like, pace differences, but mm. nine seconds to on the pace, that is very different. So... In the in the chat, uh, Shuteman's teammate has put out a hypothesis though that I hadn't considered, but it's worth entertaining. He thinks the GT fours have to run slower to preserve the tires to make the fuel stint, and he thinks Casey's overdriving the car right now. Ooh, interesting. So the he, the, the the theory is Casey will need to do an extra pit. Will have to pit earlier for tires, and it will ruin the fuel strategy. That will be interesting to see. Um, so. Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, you kind of go fast in R Factor by overdriving anyway. That's just kind of how you do it. Mm -hmm. um, even if it, you know, and again, like typically in, endur in on like endurance race, you always run the soft tires. You, know, you yeah. don't run the mediums unless you want a double stint on rare occasions because, you know, overdriving on the softs is just the quick, you know, you can sacrifice the pistols on. That's just the quickest way to do it. So, I mean, yeah, maybe this has to make an extra pit stop, but at the moment she's absolutely soaring along, so I don't know. Yeah. I mean, even if even if they finish as they are, you know, it's still going to be second place for fired up on Motorsport, so <laughs> I don't know why they're complaining. Um, <laughs> that's still a solid podium, you know? It's, yeah, I guess it's it's part of the... It's, it's a duel, so you do want to win, uh, yeah. I suppose. Second, that is true. Second place out of two cars is still last, I suppose. Yeah, um, that is true. Yeah. Out front, though, uh, Ryan Whitlock has just been putting in the laps, running solid low 113s consistently throughout this stint, just pulling away from that Mugen. Um, that said, great to see Mugen in this. Mugen, one of the, I think, probably the biggest team... I come across them and AFP. AFP's not in this, but I uh, I think between Mugen and AFP, those are the two biggest teams I've sort of interacted with. Iris is pretty big. I don't know enough about the uh, upper echelons of our factor racing, though, so maybe I'm sort of uh, talking out of my ass a bit on that, but still good to have a bigger team in this, I guess is the point I'm trying to get at. Yeah. I mean... Kind of just outside the kind of the official leagues uh, from our faction, you know, like GT Pro, GT Challenge, and all that. Yeah. Musion at the moment are the team to beat. They're just an absolute dominant force at the moment. Um, they've just got together a really strong squad. Um, you know, they've got a great group of drivers, a great group of people working behind the scenes, and it's really working for them. They're just absolutely demolished. <laughs> Any GTE category. In an endurance league, if they're there, they'll win. Yeah. You know, their GTE squads are just that strong. You know, it's almost a given that they'll win. And then again, in the prototypes as well, they're always pretty patient at MP2. Uh, <laughs> DPI, they're often there or thereabouts. But they're just, um, I mean, as you said, you know, there are a few teams around which, you know, are kind of pretty big. You know, Iris, for example, Team Imperium uh, is one that comes to mind. And uh, AFP, as you said, always a big team. 
drillers, while they were still going around, they were uh, always ones to watch out for. But, you know, at the moment, Musial are just on another realm of existence in terms of performance. They are so good at the moment. And I'm not quite sure where they get it from. <laughs> if they could, like, I don't know, if they could invite me to their Discord or something so I could see some behind-the-scenes action, that would be great. But, um, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. Give us some media passes. We demand Wait, them. I'm, I'm in so many teams' Discords that, like, I don't need to be in just in case. You know, how many? I'm in a one, two, three... I mean, like, five team discords that I don't need to be in. Like, a billion league discords that I don't need to be in. <laughs> it's like, but I'm just there just in case, you know? Just in case, yeah. I, I know that feeling. Um, once again, to not hype up Visk too much, but it's just on my mind since Alex is getting that ready for the second season. Um, Visk was always interesting to me. If only because, well, not if only because, but one of the big things that was interesting to me is you saw a lot of teams that you don't normally see uh, near the top in Visk, uh, you know, like RE Racing, uh, Epic. I guess Epic is a uh, bigger team in terms of uh, FSR, or at least they are in FSR. That is what it's called, right? The yeah, FSR. Thing. Yeah, they are in that, but uh, I haven't really seen them do the uh, crossover to sports cars. Um, you know, it was it was it was very cool in Visk seeing uh, those sort of teams ground effect have some success and, and sort of take it to the bigger teams that season. Um, even uh, GRG won the Visk GTE category, I think, in terms of uh, points, overcoming Iris and Mugens, and uh, so that's the kind of stuff you see happening with that. As Ryan Whitlock. That must be an off-schedule pit stop. I can't imagine that was planned. I know we set a saw a flash of a yellow briefly. I'm wondering if he had an off. He's now having to come in and fix that damage. Have to put in some monster laps to make up that pace, because he's going to be completely off-sync now for the pit cycle. Yeah, interesting that he's uh, coming this early. Um, maybe he's just trying out something new. Maybe. I have to see. I mean, it, as, a, as you know, it's a two-way fight, so may as well uh, see what you can get out of it if you uh, try and throw a gamble. Interesting to make the gamble. It's a long stop, though. It's been over a minute. Maybe some damage repairs. Yeah. I wonder if we can... Not really any great camera angles to see if a tire's missing. I don't know. Uh, there we go, leaving the pits now. That'll put him behind the eight ball. Put Gabor way out in front. Let's see where uh, Ryan comes out. There goes Gabor past pit lane into turn one. Now put Ryan Whitlock a lap down in that Bentley. He is faster by about a second a lap, but an hour and a half, that'll be hard to make up. But something dramatic happening. Comes through turn two. Into that difficult and tricky turn three, because the track seems almost come up on you, which is odd to say given how wide this track is. Into turn four now, very hard to find it. You're kind of looking for that apex. You don't want to come all the way across because you got a quick turn five. Come up wide, use all the track into turn six. Making sure you get as close to that pile on without hitting it. Now this is one of the more dangerous turn corners, turn seven, because there's the wall. One of the few places where you can actually wreck the car. And I am suspicious as whether or not Ryan clipped that wall last lap around him damage that car. Into the chicane now, just before the front straight. Another corner where you don't want to mess up the braking because uh, that tire barrier will kill you. And there you go. <laughs> Very quick and speedy lap at Cleveland. Not too long. Ryan did a uh, 428, but that was an out lap. Got some work to do to try and catch Gabo Hutsti now. You can see him just in front though on track. Not a lot of space between the two in terms of uh, actual on-track position, but uh, yeah, Ryan's a few laps down now. We'll get it back 
after the pit cycle, and if there's a caution, he could very well be back in a strong position for this race. But with only four cars, that will... I don't see it happening, unfortunately. Never know, though. I said there wouldn't be a safety car in this race, and there was one, so... What do I know? Nothing. You know nothing. I know nothing, for I am Jon Snow. Um... Yeah. This is a track. I feel like it looks a lot better than I remember it looking, and I can't tell if that's because of the more recent upgrades to the shaders, or if somebody came back and redid the textures on this track, because it looks significantly more attractive than I remember. Um, our Factor 2 in general, though, has really had a good last two years in terms of looking better. In the right lighting at the right moments, this game actually looks good. It, I mean, obviously, uh, all the new lighting updates are very, very fancy. Um, and yeah, as you said, right moment, right lighting, right cars. It is a very, very pretty game. Yeah. It's, I, I guess it's the price you're paying for both the width of our factor and the age of it, is that not everything is going to look as pretty as it could. But, uh, yeah, in the right conditions. What I really like about this particular track mod, though, the p benefits and negatives of it, is that the city in the background actually does look decent. Um, some of the background textures on it do leave something to be desired, but the core thing, the actual Cleveland skyline, looks right. It looks, it fits the part. Yeah, it's, um, it is, I mean, obviously, I, I'm not an expert on Cleveland or Cleveland, therefore I've never been there myself. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, I mean, it looks kind of, you know, typical American kind of city in Ohio. Yeah. Looks, looks pretty bang on. Um, it does look very nice as well. I, I mean, I, I assume this uh, track is a port from the original Laugh Act, and mainly because all the uh, the logos on the tents say Champ Car on them. <laughs> so. And uh, if this was made specifically for this game, I think someone would have had the uh, the self-respect to have changed that to, you know, say R Factor Two or something. Yeah, you so, know. Uh, it's 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 a very it's a so for the fact that it's probably from like 2007, 2008, something like that. It does look very nice. Yeah. Um. It, yeah. I mean, the grass texture looks fine. The grandstands, the as you said, the city in the background is really well done. Actually, it's one of the uh, the better landscapes I've seen from a, a sim racing when it's like set in a city. And the the track texture looks fine as well. It looks like a runway. It looks um, like a runway. <laughs> it, it's what it is. That's what it says on the tin. It looks like a runway. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it does look very nice to be fair to it, and uh, yeah, as you said, when when in the right conditions, at the right moment on the right track, R Factor Two does look very nice. Um, but to be fair, this this track is uh, is one of the best ones I've seen. Yeah, I uh, really hope it's it's sort of tough because I I find a lot of the best tracks in Europe. There's some really classic like natural terrain road courses. There's a lot of them, in fact. Um, but in North America, I find half of the really classic North American tracks are road circuits. And they are very hard to mod into games because they are in cities and there's a lot more going on to mod in a city and model. But, uh, I'm really hoping we'll see more. Because right now, like, I don't know if you've ever downloaded the old IDT track mods for R Factor 2, but they are some of the most garish looking <laughs> tracks. I've ever seen in sim racing. They look like they would fit right into, uh, I don't know, IndyCar 2 for the uh, MS-DOS. They're <laughs> not pretty. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Toronto, Long Beach, St. Petersburg, Mont Tremblant, like there's just, not Mont, Mont Tremblant, Trois-Rivières. Uh, there's the Edmonton Airport circuit. Like, a lot of the really classic road courses in North America are street circuits. So yeah, it would be great to see people give those mods another shot at some point. Um, I know Visk really wanted to do... Oh, yeah, Detroit. That reminded me. Detroit's another one. Visk really wanted to do Long Beach, but uh, there's actually a hole in the mesh of the Long Beach track. 
Oh, nice. If you take one of the corners wrong, you will literally fall off the circuit. So obviously you couldn't run that. Go into the void. <laughs> yeah. That's your racer. Yeah, sorry. Looks like they've DNF in the race. They've just gone into the realm. <laughs> um, yeah. So it would be great if somebody could come back and give them the treatment that this Cleveland track has been given. Because this track looks the part in our Factor 2, actually. Would be great to have. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is a very nice looking circuit, to be fair. Maybe I do have to give it to that. At some point. Uh, yeah. So here we sit. Not much left to go in this race. We are definitely deep into it. Only an hour and twenty minutes to go. Getting close to the point where the GT3s could almost squeak it by on fuel. Maybe another ten minutes or so. Unfortunately for Ryan, he's going to have to do another pit stop, though. So he's definitely in the, uh, definitely behind the eight ball. But he is getting very close to Gabor Hutzty right now, getting one of his laps back. Uh, for those of you who, uh, perhaps watching this and don't know what's going on, I notice Marcel Fuzzy, Fuzzy, I don't know what the, the omelette on the Yume does, um... Yeah, the pit lane is bugged at this track, so driving through the pits doesn't count towards your lap. Um, so it says Ryan's two laps down. Um, but actually, after the pit stop, you'll get the lap back, so... It will happen to... the Mugen as well. We sort of figured this in. Um, anywhere. Yes, that's where we're at. So, in terms of uh, what's going to be happening with CERT after this race, I'm going to take a quick peek at the calendar. We're going to have Mont Tremblant next, which will be interesting. Have you ever seen the Mont Tremblant track before in any form or, f or fashion? I have actually on Grid Auto Sport. Wow! Way back when on the uh, back on the good old Xbox 360 on Grid Auto Sport, there was a round in the F3 Championship at Mont Tremblant, which I probably crashed out at. But it is a great track. It is fantastic. It's so flowing. It's down the hill. It's brilliant into the first like the first few corners. I love Mont Tremblant. It's been a it's been a while since I've seen uh, anything there in the sim racing scene, and um, no one really races there in real life either. I know it's owned by I know it's owned by Lawrence Stroll though, so uh, maybe they can sort something out with that front. But yeah, great track. I'm very excited for it because I love Mont Tremblant. It's fantastic. So uh, yeah, it should be really really good. Hopefully. Yeah. Good to have. That'll be the next sprint race. That's July third. And then we're heading to a, the European part of the calendar. We're going to be at the Lausitz Ring. Carrying on with hitting tracks you probably haven't raced in our Factor 2. Um, yeah, this is a very good Mont Tremblant mod. Just came out last year. And the Lausitz Ring mod, also pretty solid. I cannot remember the last time I've raced at the Lausitz Ring. But uh, it'll be great to see other people driving it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good, um, pretty good calendar you've got going here, I must say. I was pretty impressed when I saw it for the first time, so you have my seal of approval. That's all you really need as well. Yeah, as as we established at the start of this, your opinion only one that matters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else is irrelevant. Everyone else is irrelevant. Yeah. It'll be and I, I say from the bottom of my heart, it is a good calendar. There you go. <laughs> We've done one thing right at cert. We at least Mitt chose the right tracks. I mean, you're going to the Lausitz Ring, which is, is I don't think I've ever seen any league go to the Lausitz Ring. <laughs> like, ever. I think the only track I've seen other leagues run here on this calendar is Kailami. Yeah. And maybe Donington. I think some Aussie leagues run Adelaide because, you know, Australia. Yeah. But... I've never seen anyone run Autopolis, Cleveland, Mont Tremblant, Lousers Ring, or the Bud Circuit, actually. That gets very underrepresented, but it's a yeah. great track. Yeah, I'm actually 
Man, this is... I've, I've been around too much. I'm actually commentating for a, a Asian F3 championship, and they aren't even hitting it. Which is tragic. Wow. That is tragic. But they got the Dubai Autodrome! Woo! Yay! Dubai Autodrome! Actually, actually, to be fair, the Dubai Autodrome is quite a good track. Yeah. It's not bad. Woo! Ryan getting a little bit sideways, trying to get around the fine Avant. Oh, big oh, accident! No! Big accident! Both of those cars involved. Let's do a quick... All right, so we're going to have a yellow flag here. So, Gabor, just when you get to the line, put it on the uh, speed limiter. And then we'll uh, form up the field here. Wow, that was um, interesting to say the least. Man, there's only four cars on the track, and they somehow found a way to hit each other. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the Alpine's coming straight into the pits there. Um, yeah. Hopefully he's not got too much damage. But yeah, that's. Uh, I think one of them just turned in and didn't expect the other one to be there, and that was about it, really. Yeah. That's how it works out. Man, I was uh, not expecting that. See, this is, this is what happens. I said, we're probably not going to have another yellow flag. We're probably done with yellow flags for the rest of the race, and here we are. Got another safety car. Somehow they find a way. Um, it was something I was actually joking about in the last race I commentated on, is that we were saying, like, has there been a single overtake without a collision? And in this race, I'm not sure there's been an overtake without a collision, even... Some of the dealing with the traffic. Even the fact that there were seven entries, there's now four cars running. They've still found a way to crash into each other. <laughs> I respect that. It requires a lot of dedication, to be fair, so I respect it. But... Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, huh, look at that. Both of the GT Force taking the chance to get their pit stops in. This will uh, really give Casey Soul the upper hand, though. Um, basically, almost kind of a lap on Schunemann. Schunemann is getting out ahead, though. Long stops for the GT Force, which I guess does make sense. I think in real life they have, like, one person to do everything on those cars. Um, which I actually guess is the case for all these cars. Generally, uh, most series that run these cars would only have one person to change the tires. Yeah. I yeah, GT. I mean, GT3 pit stops don't really happen in a lot of leagues. GT3 doesn't typically run endurance, um, and then GT4 pit stops just don't exist because nobody in real life runs GT4. So, yeah, <laughs> it's unfortunate. I, I guess it makes sense because uh, TCR exists, um, and that kind of uh, cuts into the same market. There we go. Ryan going to take the chance to get back on strategy here. So everybody pitting will kind of neutralize the situation in terms of pit strategy. Right now, Schunemann is the only car out on track. So I guess he's going fine. That's good to see. Would have been tragic if we were down to three cars. <laughs> Well, everyone's on the podium, at least. Yeah, everybody's a winner, insert. Um, that's just how it works. Yeah, and then when we started this league, we were really hoping the uh, Porsche Cayman GT4 car would come out, because it was supposed to be... It was one of those TM soon things. Um, but here we are. Long well, it is, what it, it is a long pistol, but it is what it is. Yeah. Imagine Whitlock has some damage from that collision. Oh, there you go. Now yeah, he's rolling. Ah, uh, he's finally pulling away. Yeah. So let's find out where everybody is. Alright. So Gabor will. So we're gonna give Gabor back control of the field. He'll just be coming around outside of turn one. So if you're uh, any of the GT4s... Just watch for that BMW just after turn one. Form up behind him. And you can just go and get your lap back there uh, in the Bentley. More stewarding. More stewarding. Yeah. I, like, I think I think uh, steward should be commented more often. I think it's interesting. That's the dynamic. <laughs> you get to know the ins and outs. This, this happened at Visk for Daytona. Um... 
So what happened was there was a brief overlap where the Amer the people in North America had to go to bed because we're getting like 3 a.m. But the Europeans weren't quite awake. And Alex Skinner was racing, stewarding, and commentating in the middle of the night. <laughs> Well, Alex Skin, Alex Skin is just a, a god, frankly. That man, that man does too much stuff for his own good yeah. in terms of sim racing. So, if you watch a Galax, hello. <laughs> that was really wide from that album. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely sending it. I mean, it would have been a great overtake if there was another car on the outside, but there wasn't, so it just looked quite embarrassing to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Peter. I, don't know, I guess if there's a time to go wide at a corner, this is the time. That's very true, to be fair. There's the, there's the, the squad as everyone heads back round. Yep. Yeah, it's unfortunate for uh, the Bentley crew now because they would have gotten. Well, I guess now they're they're equalized on fuel strategy with the uh, BMW. But that lap they would have gotten back, they've lost. They've permanently lost the lap to the BMW. And there's not a lot we can... You know what? There is something we can do. We're the race steward. We're going to do the right thing here. One sec. It's going to look very ugly on stream, but we've got to do it. Oh, boy. The game is super unhappy I just did that. Well, you know why. Let's get rid of the in-game overlay, because... Uh... I know our Factor 2 doesn't actually like that. Oh boy. What is the... There we go. Let's give that lap back. If we're all gonna be here. Let's at least make here it Here we see. <laughs> Artwork at play. Artwork at play. Um. So I'll just say, quickly... So we're just going to address the uh, bug in terms of pit stops for laps, so hopefully I'll get that done. Then we can go back to green flag racing after this lap here. There we go. Let me just sneak over here and remember. So the admin password isn't like a phrase or anything like that. It's a random series of numbers and characters. Because GRG is basically the CIA. Um, and they host the server, and that's how they set it. Um, alright. Ta-da! Ta-da! Let's see. There we go. I think that gave them their lap. Gave them one at least. Yeah, they should be one lap down. So there we go. Should be going back to green. Everything should be fine. Flawless execution. So yes, back to green flag this anything. time. Bye. Yeah, didn't see anything. I was basically peak stealth. I'm a F22 of sim racing stewarding. Exactly. Yeah, they should have still have a lap lead. That's what I said. Good luck for the last hour. Yeah. So here we go. It's a GT4 battle. Still right side by side with each other. So green at your discretion, Marcel. Let's see who comes out. Stronger here. Who's gonna go? And Marcel go. puts the foot to the floor. And it was a nice start from the Musion driver. And he leads into turn one. See if Ryan can get his lap back. Oof! As Sherman goes very wide off turn one. Apparently that practice off uh, did not prepare him. As we might have expected as that Bentley tries to take the outside. Turn two, and just messes up his line into turn three now. Lost all sorts of time. Got his work cut out from, for him in that Charger Bentley. 
It's one thing to pass a Mugen, it's another thing to uh, pass a Mugen, get a lap, and then pass them again, all within an hour. It's impressive, to be fair to them. <laughs> I've got to give that to them, that is impressive. Yeah. Meanwhile, Shunamint, gonna have Soul for company for the last hour. See if you can perhaps learn something from following her. Maybe uh, get up to her pace and give her a bit of a fight for the end. I think the for sure the Alpines will have to do one more pit stop here as well. So that's all to consider. I think the GT3s, though... Here's the interesting thing with the GT3 cars. Given the bug that we have for the pit stops and all of that, do you turn down the engine, lift and coast, and then see if you can make it without pitting again? Um... I think no, not around here. I think just because of the nature of the track, mm -hmm. um, I think I mean, it's, all, it's all straights and you know corners and acceleration zones. If it was somewhere where a lot of it was, you know, corners, then I'd say yeah. You know, you're not on throttle, but because you're on throttle so much, yeah, you can certainly lift and coast a bit. And uh, you know, I think you can certainly. You know, try and you know, just make sure that your second stop isn't as long. You don't have to pit for as much fuel. But I don't think you're one are going to be able to try and you know not make that stop. I think it it wastes you too much time out on track. That is most likely the case. So here we are, Shuneman actually being able to hold on to Soul here. So is gaining something from following. As Gabor Hutsti sets the best time. That is going to be hard for Marcel to handle, I think, if Gabor's going to be going around setting 112s in the last hour of this race. That'll be very challenging to contend with. But in GT4, the fine Avant finding some pace now in the uh, dying hour of this race. We see the sun getting uh, lower in the sky. Uh, not meant to rain today, and it doesn't look like it will. Gabber now, now from half a sector is Peter, as somebody's off. It's the Mugen! The Mugen's oh, off! No. What's so there you there? go. So there's the lap. That's the lap back. What's happened to Gabber there? I do not know. I don't know if they got... Uh... Cause yeah, he had a decent gap, too, to Marcel, so he must have just lost it on his own. I'm gonna have to try and get that back. Apologies. Oh, Am I back? I don't know. I think I've only just entered the Mev just had a moment. Um, Maybe. It didn't. wasn't that long. We heard your last comment, I think. Oh dear. Oh dear. It's uh, it's not doing too well. Oh. This could be an issue. Is it my end or your end? No, it's my end. Okay. It's definitely my end. and get that back. Hopefully, we can get that sorted. Worst comes to worst. I'll be with you, you, you folks. And by folks, I mean maybe one person. I'll be with you. As always. As we say this, Peter Schumann looking to the outside of the GRG into turn one. Goes very wide. I don't know if he was looking for the cutback. Just lost him time, though. Now we have a fight on our hands. Shunaman on the back of the GRG Alpine GT4. Comes wide into turn two to try and set himself up for a run perhaps out of turn three. But Soul collects it very nicely and manages to maintain the gap. Now looking to turn four. See a bit of damage on that Alpine from Fine Avond. We ride on board. Gabor Hutsi sets another best lap as we're here. Gets into the 111s. That Mugen is flying, trying to recover from that spin. They still have the lead by quite a bit, but uh, their lap advantage over the sole other GT3 car. Gone now. Shunaman just patiently waiting behind Soul. You could hear him get off the throttle. Trying to find a safer place to pass. It's not a terribly good place to pass there into the chicane. But turn one, and turn one is where you can make it happen. 
closing up on Soul. Once again, getting off the throttle there. I wonder if he's just setting her up. Just toying with the GRG, trying to keep the battle close. Not sure. Perhaps waiting for the best time to make it happen. Looking very wide into the outside, into the run to turn two. Goes very wide onto the grass even, and loses all of that time. I have to get it back. Peter Schumann certainly a good pair of hands behind the wheel of that GT4 car. Meanwhile... User entered your channel. Oh. Uh, hello? Oh, well, we've got two Rosses. Two Ross McIntyres for the price of one. Yeah, apparently it's not going too well. Uh, my Wi-Fi is just not enjoying User existence right now. Nope. Uh, it fixed itself? I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe? Maybe. I, got, I think it's fixed itself. Well, that was a very weird 10 minutes of just kind of sitting here and hoping it would work. Um, <laughs> I think I'm back. There we go. Uh, I'm hoping it's not going to be... that. do that again. But, uh, hello, welcome. Hello, I've returned. Yeah. We're back. Two commentators. Two commentators, two cars in every class. Um, there's a secret meaning in all the twos. Uh, while you've been gone, Peter Schooneman's just been lifting and coasting behind Casey. I wonder if he's just saving fuel using her draft. Um, try and shorten the final stint that he'll have to do later. Um, as I was saying, it's it, it, as we were both saying, I guess, really, uh, everyone's going to need to do one more pit stop before the end. The interesting thing with watching Schooneman drive, though, is he's had a... Uh, Tough time keeping it on the road once he finally does get close. And just behind them, you can see uh, Marcel Fuzzy is back in behind that Charger Motorsport BMW uh, Bentley as he just streaks past the GT4 fight. Okay, so I know that I've just returned, but I'm just going to have to shoot off quickly to go and eat some food, but I will be back. Oh, um, nice. Uh, enjoy, enjoy Christian's delicate tones while I uh, disappear. <laughs> we'll make it happen. So, here we stand. Close battle in GT4. Meanwhile, in GT3, Marcel Fuzzy slowly, slowly, painstakingly slowly, beginning to uh, put the gap on that Mugen behind. Of course, he needs to make up a whole lap on that Mugen, as we see Schooneman getting very close to that GRG. I, I'm convinced Schooneman's saving fuel at this point. Can't imagine he could make that GT4 go to the end, but maybe, just maybe, he can make it go that much further as a GT3 car gets placed between the two GT4s. Yeah, we're see getting held up a little bit. Probably not a ton of pressure to push right now in that BMW. They've got a massive gap. Just keep the car safe. The worst thing that the you can do right now if you're behind that double eight Mugen is damage the car. That is perhaps the only mistake you can make at this point. On to the front stretch yet again. Working lap. Why is it not say the laps? Working lap one. 11 about? Wow, we're pretty deep into this race. We are working lap 135, folks. I was wrong. There you go. So for those of you who are curious, it seems like you can roughly do 37 laps on fuel. Um, that's the longest stints we've seen were about 37 laps. Now, we've have had two yellow flag periods, um, two of which have involved the uh, Bentley. And if there's any reason that Bentley doesn't win the race, it's uh, just a matter of not uh, failing to not hit things. Um, 
finding a way to avoid hitting things would definitely have helped that Bentley uh, win this race. This duel, you might say. You see Schooneman just on board with him behind the wheels of his Alpine. Following the GRG of Casey Soul. He's just been staying behind there, saving fuel, being careful. Still about an hour left to go. Watching a procession in terms of that, those two. The very interesting thing going on is the hot lap contest between Marcel Fuzzy and Gabor Ritzi, though. Uh, not a massive amount of space between them. Uh, Marcel is faster, but it'll need to be a lot faster if he's going to catch Gabor in the Muga. And you've got to imagine Gabor having set the fastest lap of the race in this stint on a 1.11.923. Oof. Catching the dirt on that Bentley. Having set the fastest lap in that car, you've got to imagine he's got some pace in hand if he wants it. An interesting thing to note about this track is Champ Car did do night races here. Um, I think this race will end before it gets properly dark. But Champ Car did run night races here. They did put floodlights up on this track for that, obviously. Champ Car is not being open, while cars are not having lights. Um, but this version of the Cleveland Circuit is not from the year they ran a night race here, I don't think. So there are no lights on the track. But another one of those things. If somebody feels... Uh, feels like they want to go back and play with this track mod. Adding the uh, lights for the night would be very cool. Either you know, light up some buildings in the city, put the floodlights on the track, maybe fix the AI file. I'm sure everyone would appreciate it. Right now, watching the Bentley. Just a 515 on it. It also says 818 in the game. Either way, it is the Bentley. Put up those lap cars, see how he's doing. Had a purple first sector, but then lost it all in the second. So he does in the third sector here. That protracted qualifying battle going on right now. Using all of the track, and then some. It's a 1-12-1-4-2. That is a blistering pace to be setting. Was the second fastest in the Gavor of that time around. But even then, second to lap even will not be fast enough. Um, when you need Gavor to make a mistake, really have his pace drop off. One more spin for that Mugen. The Mugen has been around twice. On those cold brakes and tires after a restart, it has been around, but I only need some incidents to close things up in GT3. GT4. Peter Schumann is in front of Casey Soul. I completely missed the pass. In a race with this few cars, I missed the pass. Can you believe that? Here we have Casey Soul looking. Thinks better of it into turn one. Decides to flip out to the outside. Backs off and lets Schooneman through. Here we go in the run-up towards turn two. Looking to the inside. Casey Soul's there. Thinks better of it yet again. A little bit braver on the brakes, perhaps, Peter Schooneman. We have seen him go far too wide. Yes, and that's going to compromise his run. Casey Soul looking to the inside now. Not quite close enough in that Alpine from GRG. Cuts in. Another quick left-right complex there. Nowhere to really pass there. You can, just perhaps isn't the best or the safest way to do it, given we've seen so many cars get into each other. A shocking thing to say, given how few cars in this race, but nonetheless that has happened. So we see the Bentley now catching up, giving them a quick flash. Going towards the chicane. 
Those three cars go through. Everybody nice and tidy. A bit of kick of the dirt as they cut through the grass on both sides. And once again, quickly back onto the front straight. It's about a minute and a half lap for the GT4 cars here. See Schoenemann go quite wide, gets the grass there. We'll have to see if that uh, injures his run up to the line. Here we go. Nothing to be done there. For a quick moment, my uh, overlay said that Sol was in the lead before setting it back to what I believe is actually how this is working. Never quite know of this. Still knows the tail in GT4. And the gap is down down to 69 seconds of about three seconds that Marcel's cut at Fristy's lead. Since Fristy spun the car and gave him the lap back, that Bentley flying. Lost about a second in the middle sector though Marcel did. That's not going to help his effort. It's a 113.7. That is slower than Husty was last time around. See the lead BMW pass on through. Pass this GT4 fight. Only 50 minutes to go now. So, here we sit, all nice and comfy. <laughs> Man, I gotta read the comments more. There's been some fun comments on the YouTube stream. Um, huh, Lucas Lichten saying he's raced Mont Tremblant, but has not raced at Kyalami. That's interesting, that's the inverse of what I would have thought. In terms of the BMW being uncompetitive, I don't like the BMW M6 in any league it's in. As we see Casey Soul on the inside here for the pass for GT4 lead. Gets that done nice and tidy. Schoenemann is right behind going towards the chicane. You have to be careful here. There's only points if you finish. Doesn't matter if there's only uh, two cars, one car in the race, you gotta finish for points. There'll be good points on the table no matter what happens here. This is true, especially in GT3, but in GT4 it is true all the same. So we're gonna, I'm gonna take a quick moment to look at the points and sort of fill you in on what that looks like. Let's go, race report and standings. That's where I want to be. Right now, that number 444 Fine Avant is the leading car in GT4. But the number 36 is also the second place car in GT4. Um, and with the crossover in points, really, this is just the fight to see who's the leader in the championship right now, pretty much. Fine Avant leading 34 points to 28. Number 445 Fine Avant car, unfortunately not present in this race today, as is the Team Iris number 74. They failed to finish. That will definitely hurt them. That was a car that looked particularly competitive after winning out at Autopolis. Meanwhile, in GT3, Miari Racing number 25, another car that did not show up today. They were leading in GT3 standings. They scored a uh, first place, a second place at Adelaide and a win at Autopolis. Uh, ground effect number f five, though, the second place car, who scored first at uh, Adelaide and third at Atopolis. They're not here today. It's the Mugen Sim Racing 88 that will really stand to gain quite a lot. They will jump to the lead of the championship standings if they can finish where they currently stand. Meanwhile, the Charger Motorsports car has not been out yet. Uh, they attempted to come out at Autopolis, but had issues connecting to the server. Um, so they're going to be behind the 8-ball. But even so, 
by coming second today, that will jump them up to fifth in the standings. They'll bump the number 21 from Team Iris down. So still a worthwhile point haul for them. They'll be the highest Bentley up the order. See that gap beginning to form in GT4. Casey still starting to put the rockets on. Try and build a gap over the fine Avant. Back within a second, though. Look at that toe really working. Let's flip on over briefly to the uh, charge of Marcel Fuzzy, who's just put in a purple first sector. See what he can do now. Move through the second sector, past the timing stand, loses half a second. Still a bit early to see. I guess this is getting to the point where we'd start to see some tire wear. Probably another, probably a bit early. It's only been, what, 30 minutes in this thing? Yeah, there we go. So maybe we are beginning to see the tire wear. 25 minutes into the stint, I suppose. Let's see that going nice and tidy. So 1.12.35, that is a fast lap. That is over a second faster than the number 88 Mugen. Pulled that gap to down to 50, 65 seconds. Going to be very difficult though. As I said, still, he's going to need a little bit of help from Gabor to make this happen. Another purple first sector from Marcel Fuzzy. Comes through the second corner. That yeah, quick left left, say second, that was the fourth and fifth one. That quick left right into this very high speed right hander. Don't want to go too wide and touch the grass. Especially don't want to go too wide in this corner. So that's where you're going to hit the wall and we've seen some cars get into that wall. Now we're coming down towards the final chicane before the front stretch. See what Marcel can put together here. Quick left, so right then left. Out on the front straight, use all the track to the line. It's 112, 305, another fast lap. Low 112s is good. But they're going to be regretting that damage they took earlier on in the race, as I said. Uh, Certainly something the Bentley would feel like they might have won if it weren't for that. Peter Schoenman, though, once again, pulling in Casey Soul. That final Vaughn does have the fastest lap of the entire race set on it. It was a 118.947. Don't think it was Peter who set that, though. It was his teammate. Casey Soul out front. I'm running 123s right now. GT4 pace has really fallen off. Over the course of the race. As they carry on. To the beginnings of a Ohio sunset. So I'm going for our leader, Gavar Hutzti. Maybe appreciate the lowering sun here. Once he comes around and starts looking the other way. moving just casually going along no need to push now only 45 minutes there's a penalty from Marcel Fuzzy I didn't give that uh, I imagine that was for a track cut that has to hurt imagine it's a drive through or something to that effect Let's see what that is do some Quick. Uh, Channel was... switched. So I didn't give that penalty, so I'm imagining it was a track cut. I I don't know how. I think there might be a bug where, like, exiting the hairpin, there's that big open area to the right no one uses. I think it might actually give you a cut track there sometimes. Okay, I'll, I'll try and get rid of it. If it does yeah. give you the penalty, I'll give you the lap back, but let's see what I can do here. Yeah, okay. Because, like, I was watching, it was just normal driving. Yeah.
There we go. Should be gone, eh? Uh, is it gone, Chindu? No? Still not gone. I wonder if that's because the game gave it to you. I don't know. Let's see. What is it? Is it a drive through penalty? No, I had no warnings. Yeah, drive through, right, Marcel? Yeah, drive through. No, I had no cut tracks. I don't know where we got it from. Did that work? It's gone. Okay, great. Fantastic, cool, cool. Awesome. Carry Trading on. Tanks. No Thank you. Worries. Channel switched. There we go. The stewarding experience. That's what it's all about. Coming up clutch when our factor two does something odd. Not sure what that was for. It seems to have been a uh, unsuspecting track cut in a place where it isn't necessarily faster. Hopefully they'll avoid whatever part of the track gave it to them, though. Another blistering fast first sector. Marcel really putting the laps together, doing his best. Now about only a minute behind that Mugen BMW. We've hyped up Mugen a lot, but there's a lot of speed in Madhouse, Charger, that whole kit. Saw them fly in this mainly in a set of Corsa team, but we've seen some really impressive things out of Ryan Whitlock's house in our factor too. And hopefully we'll see that carry on in Visk next season. Hopefully we'll see them at Daytona. You know, CERT really started as a summer league for Visk, and it's unfortunate we really haven't had the same car counts as Visk, but I don't feel too bad tooting Alex Skinner's, uh, touting Alex Skinner's league. Is certainly one of the cooler ones, in my opinion. We see that Bentley carry off. It's starting to get a little bit cloudier again. A little bit more gray in the sky. You can still see the sun poking through. See that our helicopter. Very fancy float on by. Hop on board with Marcel's car. Now within a minute, he's flying, as I said, another purple first sector finding every bit he can to try and catch up. 40 minutes to go. It's still tight. It's been an impressive drive. It's been an impressive stint. Still gonna need a little bit more. Meanwhile, GT4 carries on. Very much nose to tail. Oh my goodness, I thought he was gonna hit that tire barrier. Peter Schumann cutting it as close as possible and drawing the line between a circuit race and a rally cross event with that line through the corner. Alpine is a very interesting car to drive. It's a free one if you don't have it. Worth a shot. Interesting one to give a go. Absolutely flying. Those two Alpines. A little bit slower than they were at the start. It's glad to see these two close together on track though. Now I imagine track conditions changing, perhaps trying to save fuel. And they're just running nose to tail. It's like uh, the Indy 500 when you have those parts of the race where there's just two cars in the front. Not necessarily fighting each other for track position. But just going, working together almost to save fuel to try and make a fuel number. And then they'll fight each other at the end in the last, you know, 10 laps. You see Schooneman now going to take the lead from Casey Soul. Slides up on the inside. No, doesn't. Casey Soul holds it on the outside and then she thinks better of it on the cutback. And that will give Schooneman back the lead in GT4. Oh, 
I never hit the multi-class button. Look at me. It seems so annoying class leaders, but here we go. Shoot him in now, looking to try and get that lead back after having lost it on the cutback. Kane's a dangerous place to do it, and he thinks better of it. See the lights on, on both of those Alpines, and bright enough to notice now, so it is definitely getting a bit darker. Trying to look now on the inside. No, thinks better of it, just holds off. I wonder if these Alpines are really just aiming to try and not pit again. That is the sense I, I'm getting. I doubt it. I, hello, I've returned. I doubt it. I think they're just going to try and last minute box it. The reason I'm thinking that is they're both running three to four seconds slower than they have in the race, and they are way off the throttle really early. Mmm, true. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, that's my uh, suspicion. Um, meanwhile, uh, Marcel Fuzzy has been putting together some amazing laughs. He's basically been banging out fastest lap after fastest lap, personal best after personal best. And... Um, Trying to close that gap, it's going to be a tough, tough thing to pull off now, with about a half an hour left to go in this race. Anything and we'll just have to, yeah, any, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Whew! Just came over to see him sideways drifting through the final chicane. Only half an hour to go. See all that suspension roll from that Bentley. I remember when the Chassis Flex update came for R Factor 2 in like 2015 and Empty Box was hyping it. It's like, man, this game drives completely differently. Man, this game is old. This game has been around. I think the beta came out in 2012, I believe, in 2011 even. It's an old game. It's yeah. been around a few years. Somebody's yellow, and there's only one car we're not seeing on track, and that's the Mugen spinning again. They've really not had a great last hour, have they? They've just kind of been finding themselves looping round and round and round over and over. Yeah, trying to keep attention. That's the sort of... These are the mistakes, though, that the uh, entire Bentley crew needs. We just need them to keep adding up. Never know where they'll be. And that's why you got to keep your uh, nose down, I guess, even when you feel like it's a bit of a hopeless situation in sim racing. You never know. What will happen? Yeah, you just kind of, kind of keep waiting and hoping. <laughs> yeah, that's the best way to put it. This is a uh, interesting thing with the Charger Motorsports. It's the uh, coming out of the Madhouse table. You can kind of see some of the Madhouse cues in terms of the uh, livery in that car. I'll have to ask Ryan at some point why he decided to name it Charger instead of Madhouse for this league in particular. I suppose it's a personal entry thing versus a team entry deal. But here we go. Half an hour ago. Slowly pushing towards sunset. Um, I don't think, as I was saying earlier, I don't think it will get fully dark. Uh, unfortunately, this track doesn't have lighting. Even though they did run night races at this track in real life. Sort of a novelty they did one or two years in Champ Car. But most of the races at Cleveland were in the day. I really want to go to a night race at some point. Um, oh, a penalty for Seoul. I wonder what that was for. Time for me to go do some uh, research. One sec. Channel switched. What happened? I got a drive through for cutting the track, and I didn't even fucking cut the track. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Which, I can it, do. it gives you a warning, too, if you try to avoid the tire stack in the last corner, by the way. Huh. Because that, that's. Julian, what you? I think you got two or three of them on your first stand trying to avoid the tire stack, and it gives you a warning for it. Yeah, yeah even at low speed, you get a warning for it. That happened to the, uh, Ryan's car as well, so... Enjoying the game of chicken out here? 
It's been interesting to watch. There you go. That should be uh, good. I do believe. Yeah. Good, good. All right. All right. I'll run away. Channel switched. There you go. Welcome back. The live steward slash race site slash commentator experience going on right now. It's the best kind of experience to be fair. <laughs> yeah. So what did you have for? I guess it's dinner for you in the UK now. Yeah, I had uh, I had chicken and pasta with some bread. It was very nice. Carbs with your carbs. The best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're, um, we're a carby culture over here. Um, you basically just eat bread, and it's usually grey or brown. <laughs> um, it usually a pie is like the perfect example of British food. Like a, a steak and ale pie. It's carbs with meat and gravy. That is basically all we eat. <laughs> it's some form of carbs with some form of meat. It's usually beige. Uh, it usually tastes really salty. It's all right to be fair, but you know we're not exactly the height of a cuisine. Fair. I'll say. See, I made a toad in the hole as a novelty. Oh, this week. toad in the hole! Now it's all <laughs> fantastic meal. <laughs> Yeah. It may have a dumb name, but my goodness, that is a good dish. Yeah. Yeah, I made that as a, uh, I'm going to make something quirky and different for dinner. And uh, that's what we made. It wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. Needed a lot of gravy to work, but it wasn't yeah, bad. Yeah, you need a lot of gravy with um, with the Yorkshire puddings. Anything with the Yorkshire pudding needs gravy with it. Yeah. It's just kind of a rule of thumb. But, oh, toad in the hole, man. It was like someone at some point was like, hey, what if I took a sausage? What if I took a Yorkshire pudding and just put them together? <laughs> and it was it was a masterpiece. Yeah. Oh, that is a classic. Oh. Oh, I really want to turn the hole. I haven't had turned the hole in so long. It's a good dish. Yeah. It's uh, funny. Canada is like former British colony. Doesn't have a lot of British food. I mean, you you guys do like poutine. I swear that's all you guys eat. <laughs> okay, poutine is the thing I haven't had in like two years um you, you'll die right quick if you eat a lot of poutine that's just yeah i can imagine it doesn't <laughs> sound particularly healthy no and I'll, and I'll be honest this is like i'm gonna lose my canadian license uh latino americans make a much better dish that's similar so controversial if anyone uh <laughs> from the canadian secret service is watching he did not just say that <laughs> What is it you called? You are hearing things. <laughs> you are hearing things. But, like, it's a Tex-Mex thing where they basically put, uh, loaded, yeah, it's like, it's like a loaded French fries, where they basically just put taco toppings on fries, and, like, at the end of the day, uh, uh people, the, the people of Mexico have a better selection of, uh, spices going on in their, uh, cuisine than the French Canadians do, so it, it obviously worked out better. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, yeah. I mean, what's a, what's another staple dish that we have? Um, just trying to think. I mean, toad in the hole is just a classic. You know, it's it's such a good food. Food. Um, yeah. I mean, fish and chips. Um, it's quite greasy, but it's delicious. Yeah, can't go wrong. With fish and chips. No, you can't. It's just you know. It's just a classic, you know, and then whenever someone brings it up, you know, you have to go. It's like, oh, what are you thinking for dinner? I was like, oh, I don't know. I was thinking fish and chips, and you just have to go. <laughs> so you're going out, going out for lunch. So like, what are you thinking? Fish and chips. You just got to go get fish and <laughs> chips at that point because they've said it now. It's too late. Yeah, you're committed. Um, I don't know. I mean, pie, I've already said. Um, if you want to go for the healthiest spectrum, uh, a BLT. Is, is probably the healthiest food that we have. <laughs> it's still got bacon on it, too. <laughs> yeah. Just, just you know, it's bacon and bread with some vegetable and fruit on it. That's as healthy as we go. That's the height of British health cooking. It is. It is. <laughs> I mean, it's got, to, it's got to the point where, like, that we eat so many, like, crisps or, like, chips, if you're American. Yeah. That, like, it's actually starting to become a environmental problem because they use a certain gas within the bags to stop them like going stale. <laughs> and we eat so many of them. 
that it's actually becoming an environmental. But they also have like a ridiculous amount of fat in them. But um, yeah, that's not the concern. The concern was the environment. <laughs> so we're, we're having a crackdown on that at the moment, um, which you know is a uh, upset many. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, what what other foods? I mean, there's curry. Curry's a, a staple. Yeah. Um, because we claim it's Indian when actually it was invented in the Midlands. Um, if you went to India and asked for anything that was vaguely like what we have here, you'd get laughed out of the country. Uh, it's greasy. It's but it tastes amazing, so it's fine. <laughs> um, what else? I mean, again, stuff like Chinese. Like our Chinese is nothing like actual Chinese food, but you know, yeah. it's, it's bangs. Um, a roast dinner, of course. That's a classic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just gonna Google some British dishes because I don't really think of anyone. The shepherd's pie is crap. I'm Oof. sorry, I'm saying it now. Like when, like it's it's fine, but like when you're like ten years old, you walk in from school and say, like, "Oh, what are you having for dinner? Shepherd's pie." Oh, <laughs> the one so you've had too many it's times. Su it's such a letdown. <laughs> uh, ten traditional British foods probably means English foods because Scottish traditional dishes is just chuck a Mars bar and a deep fat fryer. <laughs> Shepherd, that that is an actual thing they do in Scotland. They take Mars bars and they deep fry them. Apparently, it's delicious. I've never tried one. Uh, well, I've gone to a fair here, and they had deep-fried Mars bars and deep-fried Oreos, so... That sounds amazing. It's one thing you have once, you're like, this is amazing, I'll also die if I ever have this. Yeah, game. very true. Um, yep. Sorry, uh, steak and kidney pie, that's a good one. That is one I've Born never pasty. That's a, that's a banging meal. <laughs> oh, that now we're talking. There is history behind it as well. There's an interest. So, so you know that the, the shape of pasty. So it's kind of got that, that pocket with all the meat in, and then it's got that 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 weird like crust on it. Yeah. It's because what it was traditionally a miners' dish. It was what the miners used to take down for lunch when they went into the mines. And what they do is they'd eat the meat pocket, and yeah. then the crust they just throw away. Because, you know, it was just something for them to hold on to, you know, and then it would all get covered in dirt. Nowadays, I know we don't really do mines in the UK anymore. So, mm. uh, it's kind of, you eat that as well. But And that it, used to, it used to have a sweet side and a savoury side as well, so you'd have a dessert. So, on one side would be your meat and potatoes, and then on the other side, there'd be fruit. So, huh. you'd eat the savoury side, and then you'd eat the sweet side as like a dessert. But that, that's also kind of died out. But, mm. um, that is a good, that's a good, a good dish. That's um, interesting. You know what? I didn't know. It only came clear to me when you sh when I looked up Cornish past because you mentioned it. So, a big thing like cause my family's like uh, at least my father's side is from is like uh, Caribbean, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a big Caribbean food called a Jamaican patty. I don't know if you've had that. Yeah, yeah, I've had that. And it's actually a development of a Cornish pasty that Cornish immigrants brought to Jamaica. Ah, huh, interesting. I did not know that. Things oh, I've just discovered. Um, it was a product of Cornish immigrants and Indian indentured laborers' food coming together, and it became a Jamaican staple. It was Cornish immigrants going to Jamaica and finding out that spices exist. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and then just vastly improving it. Oh, well, there you are. There you well, you are. know, see here, um, uh, sir, we're just we're just educating you on food at this point. Yeah. It's funny with the curry. I remember we had a really long argument about it because my sister brought up curry as moder as it currently is eaten is like a product of like British people basically taking yeah. various spices from across the empire to make this thing. Mm. But curry exists as a thing in India, but it means something different. It's more of like a broad term for a kind of condiment. But it yeah, doesn't think, translate think, to our understanding of a curry anymore. I think, I, again, like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure. I think like a curry in Indian is like a certain type of dish. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, a, it's like a dish you eat like a certain type of day or it's like with a certain thing in it or something. It's not like yeah. just like... A generic name for food like we use it yeah but you know i mean british imperialism wasn't exactly the most uh what's the word i'm looking for they, they weren't the most kind of like 
uh, loving people in terms of their attitude towards different races and cultures. So yeah, yeah. So uh, that, that's how curry came to be. Yeah, my understanding of it though was the British, like the curry that we think of as being British, was a product of the British trying to preserve meat across voyages. So it was a way of hiding spoiled I meat. I don't think so. I think what it was is we. I mean, we we. I mean, obviously, a load of Indian people kind of emigrated here. A lot of British people emigrated to India when we first kind of um, conquered India, mm -hmm. um, and the British Raj was set up there. Yeah. And I think it was just a. Uh, I think it was just an Indian chef just trying to make up a dish of what was like what he could that was similar to home, mm -hmm. and came up with. I think it was a tikka masala he came up with, and then everyone was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" and now here we are today. Casey Soul is definitely saving fuel. She's she, she, she's, she's lifting. lapping slowly. She's lapping so slowly and she's lifting. I think both of the GT fours are trying to see. They're in. And she mentioned to me when I briefly came over to her uh, team chat to help them with the uh, game, giving them a penalty. Um, that they're in a game of chicken. I think that's the game of chicken they're in. They're both in a game of chicken to see who can make it on fuel to the end. Because if you yeah, pit, that's... if you pit and the other team makes it, you're screwed. Which is an interesting yeah. thought. <laughs> it's yeah, it is a game of who blinks, basically. Who can make it? Who blinks? Yeah. Oh, man. It's, Moments yeah, I wish I yeah, I wish I could see their fuel gauges and see what the numbers are that they're contending with because they are lapping so off the pace to try and make that fuel number work. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, um... So you do sometimes get these weird situations in endurance where you, you just find people desperately trying to save fuel. Um, I don't know, it's... I, I'm not a big fan of it. I think you should just pit. I think pitting's always better because you, you can at least, you know, try and catch up to people, but... Yeah. I mean, Case as well, she, like, she, she was lapping so quickly earlier on. Yeah. I reckon if she just pushed, I reckon she'd have time to catch back up if she boxed now. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not the driver, so she may have, have other ideas about that one. Yeah. Who well, really knows? GT3 is a whole entirely separate deal. Marcel's been setting, like, personal bests almost this entire stint. Trying to That's catch. Impressive. Yeah. He, uh... Ryan, his teammate, said to me, I'm not good in clutch situations, and I understand that's why they put Marcel in the car, because he's like, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't make up the gap. <laughs> it's it's you or we bust, and Marcel tried to rise to the challenge. 20 minutes to go, though, 36 seconds. Oh, it's going to need to make up more than a second a lap to make that happen. It's more doable than it was before, because Gabor did spin once, but... Gotta be flying, man. He's going over. A, he's going about a second and three tenths a lap faster. So there yeah, is some pace. some pace. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's just over 15 minutes to go. Um. Just gotta hold it in for that amount of time, and he should be okay. Yeah. Gotta think that's what the Mugen's approach is right now. There's no reason to push. We have a big gap. Maybe just save the tires if we need to push when he gets close to us, we can burn it. Because I imagine both of these GT3 cars, which I'm fairly sure they'll need to pit again for fuel, because they last pit about an hour and ten to go. We can do about an hour on a tank of fuel in a GT3 car. But 65 minutes, I think, is the target usually for GT3 uh, stint times. Um, yeah. So I imagine neither of them are going to change tires. So I'll just take the splash and dash. Yeah, potentially. So, yeah, just trying to save the tires. I imagine the Mugen fight in the end if they need to fight in the end. Um, but yeah, not to get completely caught into food again, but food is a very fun topic. <laughs> <laughs> we can get back into food. I don't mind getting back into food. I like food. <laughs> Um, yeah. Not a lot of, like, uh... So where I'm at, the big two distinct foods are Vietnamese and, uh, Mediterranean food. Hmm. Huh. Which you wouldn't think, but, uh, the city I'm in has a ma has probably as many Vietnamese restaurants as it has McDonald's. 
and has almost wow. as many Lebanese and uh, Greek places to match. Um, there's even a very there's a Canadian food that doesn't get as much daylight just because I think the uh, poutine is so particularly outlandish to people who haven't had it. But we have another food called a donair, which is basically a Canadianized gyro. Right. Um, that is worth trying if you ever have the opportunity. If I'm ever in Canada, I'll, um, I'll give it a go. Yeah. I mean, yeah, our foods are... I mean, our foods are all... It's weird because our foods are actually... A lot of it's to do with kind of class. I know it's really weird, but kind of traditionally... A working class dish was very different to like a middle and an upper class dish. Yeah. Like for example, you know, like a lot of the dishes that we consider a classic dish are working. You know, Cornish pasta, for example, was working class. Um, a roast dinner was a working class dish. Uh, a pie was a working class dish. You know, all the stuff that you know, like pastry was easy to eat, it was quick, it was simple. That was a work. It was kind of with fish and chips as well. Quick, simple, cheap. Well, at the time, anyway, it's now really expensive. <laughs> You know, it's, it's the more complex stuff. So stuff, you know, like, uh, like a lot of the puddings we eat nowadays, they're all like all berries and stuff. Was all very, you know, upper class. A full English, kind of probably more upper class because of how expensive it would have been to get all that stuff together. Yeah. So it's weird because you know, class in Britain. So I'll try not to get political here because I do. I don't want to start that. One. <laughs> but, um, because it will. Uh, I am actually reading a book about class in Britain at the moment, actually. It's very interesting. Now I'm starting to talk about it. I've just remembered I'm reading that. Um, yeah, class in Britain is very weird. It's, um, I mean, culture in Britain is weird as it is, because it is literally, when you, on a surface level, mm -hmm. you know, you've got England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, we all hate each other, and now we're one country for some reason. <laughs> but then when you boil it down, even by you know, like era, it's something like every 20 miles you travel, there is a noticeable change in the accent. Yeah. It's like it's like every area is so different. Like the, the way they use the language is different. You know, what they eat is different. You know, how they go about their day's lives is completely different. You know, if you... It's, it's just... It's, it's just... It's a very weird country. Um, and then somehow we managed to conquer a course of the Earth. So <laughs> don't ask me... Don't ask me how we did that. And it's like one of the most prevalent things was there was there's a, a big class division here. It's almost like the people you know who are working class living on a completely different planet to those who are like middle class and upper class. Yeah. And just the, the way that the culture works is so different. It's it's really quite strange. It's quite hard to explain either mm -hmm. without actually experiencing it firsthand. Like a lot of um working class people you know there's a lot of like you know family values and traditions and like often the way their families are it's like often in a working class family for example it's you know that the, the mum in the household is like the, the one who runs the house it's all about the mum you know it's dead the, you know it's the mother's hen nest you know they're doing that yeah. but you know in a middle class family typically it's the dad that's that the one who runs the house you know they're the they're the one you know bringing the bread or the mum stays home and you mm -hmm. know watches the kids yeah so it's just it's, it's just those weird little details like that so a lot a lot of the food is from different cultures so like a lot of like the, the mainstream kind of british dishes are actually all in very traditional working class dishes yeah. you know from you know the 1800s mm -hmm. so it's a bit weird like that um yeah i don't know and then uh, it's all the fancy stuff basically was all upper class that's kind of how it works really yeah so i don't know why it is exactly like that but it is yeah well, there you are See, the Americas is very interesting because a distinct upper-class culture really didn't... It, it, there was beginnings of it, but it got swamped by popular culture in the 50s and 60s and kind of got eliminated. So most of the really distinctly North American things... And I, I say North American, I should really specify. I mean Canada and the U.S. because I know Mexico is a... Mexico is part of this world, but also not. Um, yeah. I mean, it's the difference. It's, it's one's English, you know, like British and English culture. The other yeah. one's Spanish. So, yeah. But a lot of uh, Canadian and American stuff is really... It's like... It's either... Sort of like uh, the middle class stuff that came out of the 50s, or it's black people, like former slaves... Yeah. Culture. Like, that's like the two 
things. So you're either eating like uh, like burgers and that kind of stuff that's very like stuff of like 50s middle class. Or you get into like Cajun stuff, which is like very much a mix of uh, sort of uh, black food and like uh, Acadian sort of French people food. Um, yeah. But there's not like these big... Uh, yeah, so it, it's interesting how that makes. And then, of course, once you get into the U.S., you also add in some of the Tex-Mex stuff in the Southwest, which to me is really the peak of what North America has to offer the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you can you can keep your old wars, you can keep your technological advancements. Tex-Mex is where. Yeah, I don't know. When you get into like actual like Mexican food, actual like Central American food, I don't know. I, I think they've got us beat. That mix of, like, colonial Spanish with, uh, former Aztec and indigenous stuff is very good. Yeah. Um, so here we go. Ten minutes to go. Unless something dramatic happens, I don't know if Marcel's gonna make up that gap. But it's shocking to think Shuneman and Sol were sticking side by side. I'm wondering if Sol decided... Screw it. I'm just going to gun it to the end. I'm not going to make it on fuel. Potentially. Maybe maybe they've got maybe she's, she's got enough now. Or maybe yeah, maybe they've saved enough. Mm. Um, which would beg the question why Shuneman's holding back. Perhaps they didn't save as effectively. Um, meanwhile, in GT3, 10 minutes to go. Somebody's going to have to blink and pit soon. I'm sure of it. In the next 5 minutes or so. Getting into the golden hour of our factor two. This is always the interesting time of day in a real race because it's usually when the fastest laps are set, right when it's not quite darkness but it's starting to cool off. Yeah, it's when the track's cold, but not too cold, and that you start losing grip. It's that perfect temperature out on track, and you've still got good visibility as well. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's just one of those times. We don't, we don't really get golden hours here in the UK, it just rains. But, um, <laughs> I mean, for context, it's currently raining right now. So, you know. There <laughs> you go. I, I went to, uh, I, I kind of understood the joke that it rains a lot, and I've been to no sunny places in Europe, and I was like, oh yeah, it doesn't rain as much here. I went to Texas a couple years ago, and I was there for two weeks, Yeah. and it didn't rain once. Yep. And I, that, that was the longest I had ever been without rain. I was genuinely so... I was almost upset. <laughs> the lack of rain. It was, it, was, it was honestly such a weird feeling. Because I... You know, the only time I could think of it's been anywhere near that was we had a massive heat wave in the summer of 2018. Yeah. Um, like, it was, it, was, it was a big thing. Like, if you go on Google Maps in, like, 2018, like, you can just see all the grass in the country is just dead. It all just yeah. died. Um, it was quite depressing, actually. It was so hot, and I don't think it, I don't think it rained for like two weeks at one point then. But it's just like it does rain a lot, and like it didn't really. It, I, I knew it rained a lot, but it didn't really hit me how much it actually rains until I went to Texas. Like, oh, it does rain a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The the yeah, U.S. Well, like once weird. you get to there in the Southwest, it like well they're having a drought right now. It can go months without raining, so or any significant rain. That's uh. A little that bit too fun. much for me. Yeah. Um, see, here at least we're on a river, so it, it rains, but it ends up being humid most of the time and not raining, which is really the worst of all worlds. Yeah. I know what you mean. It's like, again, like here in summer, it's so humid, it's it's borderline disgusting. Like, it, it, it's, like a, it's like a running joke that we complain about when it's cold, but we also complain about when it's hot. Yeah. But it's because... Whoa, that was a big save. Whoa, 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 whoa. Another big one. Good save there. Um, what was I saying? Uh, just, just to let you know, there is still a race going on in the <laughs> Um, Yeah, it was like, it's because it's so humid over the summer. It is like disgusting to go outside. It just feels horrible when you step outside because of how humid and hot it is. It's like, ugh. Yeah. It was like, well, again, when I went to Texas, it was. You know, 30 degrees in Celsius, you know, every day I was there, and I could comfortably walk around in jeans. <laughs> Here, 
if it's 22 degrees, I will be in a pair of shorts, shirt off, sweating, fan on, like, complaining about how hot it is. It's yeah. so weird. I can't describe... I just can't describe it, but it's just not fun. It just yeah. feels like <laughs> twice as hot as it actually is. I, I know what you mean. Um... I, I will be happy when I can turn the fan on when this is over, because I have it off so it's not just the sound of my fan blowing in the room. Oh, it's and it's hot where you are. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry that you had that off. It's five yeah. minutes. You can survive. Yeah. I'll survive, yeah. Um, yeah. The worst place I've been for the summer is Florida. Because Florida is the humidity, but you're also close to the equator. Oh. So it's like, it's like already 38 degrees, and you have 90% humidity, and you're like, oh my god. Oh my god. That sounds bad. Yeah. More of the story, nothing redeemable about the state of Florida. That is my argument for today. If anybody <laughs> from Florida is watching, we hold no apologies towards you. Um, <laughs> this is not just our opinion, it's also the opinions of the league. Um, <laughs> it's the official position of There's RF2, a reason sir. we're not going to Sebring, okay? That's yeah. all I want to say. Oh my god, yeah. Yeah, Florida, I've heard, is pretty bad. Um, yeah. Just weather, weather just sucks. I just don't, I, I just don't like the weather. It can just go away. Thank you. Goodbye. I legitimately like Canadian winters. There's legitimate positives for Canadian winters. Um, I'll, I'll put that out there into the world. It doesn't get as cold as people think. It's just good. You can just stay inside, put a blanket on, you're cozy, it's good. Nothing negative. You can always put more clothes on, you can't take clothes off, that's what I say. Yeah, I mean, again, like, I, I, I like the winds here, but the problem is that everyone else complains about it and just kind of gets sucked in. Yeah. And it, do, it, it also is just cold. Yeah. Like, there are some days when it's, like, really horrible and sometimes it's just, like, chilly. And that's fine, but it's like when it snows, like it's nice and all, but it just like turns to mush like immediately. <laughs> it's like uh, it's just it's not like nice, no, it's just depressing. So the first day you see it, it's like oh, it's snowing, yeah. and then the second day it's like oh, cool. So then the third day it's like oh, please just go away. I'm fed up with the snow. I hate the snow. <laughs> Just it's just, it just becomes stuff. so depressing. So yeah. it's like the same thing. It's like, it's like, oh, it's snowing. Let's go build a snowman. And you go up for half an hour and then you're like, I hate it here. <laughs> I hate this country. I hate <laughs> Why am I out here building a, a man out of snow that will melt in about 32 hours? Yeah. 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 See, here you make a snowman that lasts the whole winter. Oh, it becomes a symbol nice. of your driveway. Um... So here's what I'm wondering now. Now we're within the last five minutes. The Bentley has made better fuel in this race. Um, has generally gone about three or four laps further. If that BMW is marginal on fuel, he has some time to spare to save it. But I'm wondering now. I'm, I'm, I have so many questions in my head about fuel numbers now. Um... I did see Ryan Whitlock joking now that he wished that he hadn't agreed to making this race four hours. <laughs> Given the, they're barreling towards that Mugen at a rate of knots, but there's just not enough time anymore. Well, the race is nearly done. Yeah. Oh well, it's still a second place. It's still good points. Uh, meanwhile, Casey Soul now just controlling that lead to Shuneman. Shuneman has made it up a bit in the last few laps, but... It's amazing to think, when this stint started, Casey Soul and Schooneman were on top of each other. That sounded terrible. Um, Casey Soul and Schooneman were very close together on track. Um, and now where we sit, the GT3s are closer together than the GT4s, which is surprising. I didn't think that happened. I thought uh, Mugen would have had a much easier go of it at the end, but... Uh, that Charger Bentley is putting in the laps. At least keeping them honest. I mean, it's got about... I mean, hang on, if I can plot my official clock. It has about 40 seconds until the checker flag, which means, unless there's a plus one lap roll, this should be his final lap coming up now. Am I behind? I might be behind. Uh-oh. I might hit the wrong button. You made me self-aware, uh -oh. so whether I was behind in this stream. Uh-oh. 
Are we behind or are we good? Looks the go to live feed button worked. Let's go to, uh, yeah, in-game panels is what we want. Tape delay. So, yeah, we have a tape delay. So we were live. All right, that's cool. Well, the checkered flag is now up whenever they cross the line next. Um, that, that's uh, four hours is up. Yeah. It says two, it says two uh, minutes left for me. Huh. Yeah. I know, it's now paused, I think, so... There we go. Yeah, it still says two minutes for me, and on the timing... still says well, two minutes. Well, maybe the race started, though. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, that's odd. I, I guess it is, yeah, because it is 4 o'clock p.m. Yeah, so we did have the pace lap. I guess the pace lap, uh... It was probably a five minutes added for the pace lap to go work around. That's my yeah. guess. Man, yeah, maybe it must be that, then. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, Marcel has just decided to settle in, finish the race now. Not going to make it up 20 seconds in two minutes. It was a really, really good effort. Really respectable drive. Try and make that happen. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a very good drive, to be fair to them. <clears throat> um, they've, uh, I mean, it's Muge and they just kind of do everything right, it seems. Yeah. Few spins in this race, but fortunately there wasn't enough people around to punish them for it, at least for their sake. But here we go, working the penultimate lap now for Gabor Witzti. The Mugen 88 lights on as we're heading into the sunset now, and the sun setting on the Cert 4 Hours of Cleveland. Just has to bring that BMW GT3 car home. Very tragic. The new BMW GT3 is ugly as all heck. I'm just going to put that into the world once again, ensuring oh. we will never get proper sponsorship. Um, <laughs> here we go. Final lap for the GT3s. Revs up into that first corner. Cautiously onto the power. No need to push too hard now. But a solid barrier behind. Comes all the way out. Doesn't use all the track this time around. No need. Doesn't even cut into the grass. Just cautiously taking this car around. Well, I'll put this out in the world as well. It's been fun. We made it. We made this bearable. Four hours with four cars, the two of us. Thanks. It was good fun. It yeah. was good fun. Basically hosted a podcast. That's always the goal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I always find that there's a, there's a lack of any entertaining sim racing podcast. So I feel we've put the world to right today. Yeah. There you go. It'll be good to have you with us at Daytona when we do that for Visk. For now, we'll be watching Gabor cross the line in Cert. Get himself a win. And another win for Mugen to go into that trophy chest. Flash of the lights. And there you go. Congratulations to Mugen. Meanwhile, GRG going to pull home a trophy. Managing to beat the championship leading Fine Avon team. See Casey Soul coming up to the final chicane for her final time. Absolutely. It's going to be Casey Soul winning the GT4 <laughs> category. What a drive! <laughs> oh. Truly I won I'd for the ages. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd inject a bit of passion in. <laughs> seeing as how I've had a, a sincere lack of it all event long. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. Well, to be fair, it's been a good drive from the, CR, the uh, GRG team. I'll give them that. Good job, everyone, getting through that. Congrats to all of you for just seeing that through. And, of course, congratulations to the Mugen 88 crew and the... GRG 36 crew. Great job, everyone, though, as I said. Uh, yeah. So, I'll be around if anyone wants to uh, debrief with me and give any feedback. Once again, want to thank you all for joining us. And hopefully we'll be seeing you out next go-around. As we'll be taking things to the European calendar next. See you all soon. I think it was Europe. I completely forgot what the next race was. Oh well. I'm dumb. Next Mont race. Mont Tremblant. 
Okay. I lied. It's not European. We're still in North America. We're coming to Canada. It's Mont Tremblant next. Hopefully, we'll see you there. July 3rd. Deep. And, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you around. Okay, there we go. Oh, we can pull Ryan up for an interview. Let's do that. Let's just, for the sake of it, just for old times' sake. User was moved to your How you doing, Ryan? I'm in pain. <laughs> um, we totally had the pace for the win more than the pace for the win and then I bend it while Shindu was going to get food so not only did I crash we couldn't even you know like try and extend fuel for an hour and a half because he was going and getting food so it's rough it's a good effort though had an absolutely blistering final uh final stint there definitely as you said the pace was there just unfortunate couldn't put it together and for the win so what was the uh thinking at the end because i felt like you guys went further in fuel on the last stint than you had all race were you guys saving fuel or did it just work out that way um so we started out pushing really hard initially and then we kind of had to save towards the end uh we were just pushing and then seeing what happens and then you know with five minutes left the gap was still like 15 seconds so we just kind of gave up and had to save fuel so we could see through to the end without having to take another stop and deal with the bug. Yeah. That's unfortunate. So, I guess here's here's one. It's almost a faux pas to ask, but I'm just curious. So, when you're driving in a race with only one other opponent, what's sort of the thing that you do to keep yourself focused throughout that? What kept, kept you in it? <laughs> well, normally it's the Delta, but my Delta was broken. Oh, <laughs> um, oh, it was just watching the gap and doing the times I could do. Uh, Cleveland's a fun track once you kind of get into the flow of things. I was just setting the laps I could and doing what I could. Um, reason I bend it, I just clipped the apex of a corner a little too much, caught the grass. I think sent a cone flying and got sent into the wall. Yeah, it's 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 surprising how this track really only has two corners that can punish you, but they are two particularly difficult corners. Mm -hmm. And they can't catch you. Yeah, up. and the, it was fun with just two cars. Thankfully, it wasn't like it was actually a competitive race between two cars. I, I really hope, look forward to a hypothetical season two and a big grid at this track. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Big grid here would be so fun. That's why I pushed for it so hard when we were making the calendar. Yeah. That will be... Hopefully we'll get to see that, because that would be amazing. I hope so. I hope so. Underrated track, for yeah. sure. Well, I, I think I'll let you recover from uh, that pretty uh, spirited drive, given all, all things considered. Really want to thank well, you Well, I get to coming. go to work. Oh. But... <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah. well, well done out there. Enjoy your shift. <laughs> Enjoy uh, your thanks. shift. Thanks, guys. It was fun. I'll see you at Montremblant, hopefully. Yeah, see you around. Awesome. User disconnected from your channel. Well, Ross, I think we can call it there. Say a uh, job well done. Give each other a pat on the back. Hopefully we'll yeah. see you around. Yeah, I certainly got my uh, good job. I mean, you held off half an hour while I wasn't there, which is more than I would have done probably because I probably would have just given up and cried. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and uh, again, thanks for, thanks for inviting me along. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. Do appreciate it. Awesome. Really appreciate having you along. And uh, with that, we'll wish you all... 